I'm tired of playing my favorite tabletop RPGs as one of the old boring races. I don't want those generic store brand backstories. I want to roll a character with a bit more <laughs> character. Well, Roll for Combat is here to help with their incredible new book, Battle Zoo Ancestries Classic Creatures, which gives you the power to create the character of your dreams. Dig into 12 unique playable monster races in this beautifully printed, massive, hard cover book filled with in-depth descriptions, abilities, lore, and more. Send that dusty old dwarf right back to the mines and live out your isekai fantasy by becoming an actual intelligent weapon that you wield yourself. Or you could let a friend grab you instead. <laughs> Teamwork. Put that elf back on the shelf and become a sentient dungeon, complete with traps, treasures, and a living avatar. You could even put an end to the age of man and become a shape-shifting mimic. Y you know, those things that gave you trust issues ever since you were eaten by one in Dark Souls? Ooh, that could be you. Click the link below or head on over to BattleZoo.com to secure your copy of BattleZoo Ancestry's classic creatures today and become the life of your adventuring party. Here we go. Hey! Now we're live. Jack Packard, Second Wind, Red Letter Media, Adventure is Nigh, somehow wandered in. Uh, I I, uh, I I opened the wrong door, and here I am. Well, there you go. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. So tell me, because I surprised Jack over Christmas and sent him one of everything we have. <laughs> and I mean everything. Like, you got the plushies, you got the oh. maps, you got the books. What was some that? You just got, like, a big books. box, and what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I got some phenomenal, phenomenal creature books, um, and I mean it, it was it was great. It was it was super great. Uh, you the the thing that surprised me though was you sent me them in both uh, uh, D and D five E editions and Pathfinder two E editions. Right. <laughs> well, that's it. Wouldn't be everything if you didn't get both. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. Uh, it's phenomenal. And you are, you might be using them, maybe. Or maybe, oh, maybe okay. I, I, you know, we for adventures now. For anyone who doesn't know, hi, uh, uh, I am the uh, game master for a uh, D and D fifth edition actual play. Uh, YouTube show uh, called Adventure is Nigh. We are uh, in the midst of wrapping up our third season, uh, looking to shoot our fourth, actually just next month, which is terrifying. And uh, I mean, for all of our seasons, I like to pull from, you know, monster manuals and this, that, and then kind of, you know, reskin things to fit our story. Uh, and it it was the, the, the most fortuitous thing is I had this really stupid idea for a monster. And I was like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if something like this exists. And I couldn't find it until I was flipping through one of your books. Uh, and I won't spoil what that monster is because uh, I think it's going to play a big part <laughs> in in uh in the seasons to come but it's it's so funny i was like i was looking for a monster <gasps> it's in your book you kismet go. can we say was it in battles new best series strange and unusual was that the right book because i think you've told me which one it is and that it is from that because if we I... know which book it's from then if you who are watching this are one of the winners who created monsters battles new best series strange and unusual your monster might be the one that is going to play a big role in Jack's adventure. So you should watch um, to see if it was your monster on there. And now we have like, I don't know how many winners there were because <laughs> there were 137 prizes, but some of them were the same person. So sure. if we say there are 60 winners, they can all watch the show and um, see whether or not it was theirs. Or maybe we'll see who had the best idea. Absolutely. Well, we'll see if their monster <laughs> might get to kill Yahtzee. Or anyone, really. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the hope. That I is try the hope. so hard to you know, like and obviously, you know, this isn't a home campaign. This is a uh this is a uh an actual play, so a little more story focused and while I don't want to kill my characters, the the option is there. I have warned all of them that, like, if they die, I'm not going to give them plot armor. Uh, but my real hope is to get them as close to death as possible every single episode, and they oh always God. spoil my plans. Really? So if you don't want to do that, then make sure your players don't see uh, Battle Zoo Ancestry She which is one of the ancestries that is in the year of monsters that you got. And that is in the classic creatures that um, just started on the backer kit and is still in its first 48 hours because 
they have a feat called plot armor because of the fact that they <laughs> since they're based on fairy tales and yeah. their logic is not mortal logic it actually works like story logic yeah yeah and so if you're fighting an opponent that's not like a final villain or climactic bun that's important for your story and you were about to die then once per day as a reaction you can be like no this wasn't important enough for me to die and the plot armor actually protects you and it's actually balanced as a feat yeah. with like other feats of its level but it's called plot armor so make sure that they don't is, see that that is hilarious i love that idea oh man yeah because yeah we the, the next thing we do as a group is going to be our level up session before we film season four and uh there will be you know the the levels of the game where they can gain a feat i might have actually <laughs> I will tell them about that because I think it's funny. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, and that's for five e two. It's uh, it's yeah, a yeah. different it's a different ancestry, but you can still use it if you wanted to. Don't make deals with the fairies though. They also can like force you to commit to something you agreed to do, and all sorts of other storytelling. Oh tropes. yeah. Oh so, yeah. I love a good curse. Oh uh, well, then you'll like what we do. Because we, you're, you're going to be cursed <laughs> just talking to us. So speaking of curses, so this is check this out. I don't know if you can see this check. We oh, I can, this, I can. This this mimic, your dice box mimic. That if you it's pledge, a dice guardian. It's a you, mercenary mimic you that you now, can employ to guard your treasure. <laughs> it's only the first forty eight hours, and that started yesterday. So there's less than twenty four hours to go. You get, get this for free, for free. Absolutely. Get in there, everybody. It's it's. I think it's wonderful. Look at that thing. Even I'm yeah. impressed. I'm like, I, I, I'm like, what is this guy? Well, it, I tell you, it's amazing what you can find in China. That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah. Stephen, <laughs> you you're impressed by like by all of our incentives, but everyone I've showed this to is impressed, and some of them weren't as impressed by our scroll case incentives, which I like them. Um, but scroll this case one, is cool. This mm -hmm. one is ridiculous, and it's also just flat out a more expensive incentive. The scroll case was yeah. like twenty dollars. This is like fifty dollars. You can yeah, find yeah, it on yeah, Amazon yeah. and other sites. Yeah, and it's free for the first forty-eight hours. Yes. people mm -hmm. keep selling me like, how, "How is Steven even doing this?" I don't know. Well, this is also not exactly ours. Will look a little different than this one, right? Um, but this, this is, is somebody it's else's, it's right? Pretty, yeah, it's someone else's, but it's going to be close. They'll use the same design, sculpt, and make it look similar. It's the same size, same weight, same company. So we're just going to make it look probably maybe a little closer to what ours look like, uh, but it'll, it'll basically right. look the same. So, but anyhow. Do check that out at yearmonsters.com. And as usual, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Jack will answer any question. Any question. Any. 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 You can ask him what underwear he has on now. He'll, he'll tell you. He will. Okay, maybe not. But he'll tell uh, you what you underwear know, what if, what I if the answer have is on. none? Oh! <laughs> well, Jack You don't goes, know what I'm wearing. You Jack don't know what's going on down here. Commando. There you go. There's your question. Uh, <laughs> yes, you still have the 48 hours. You, you have until tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern. So what is the meaning of life and boxers or briefs? Well, neither, because he's going commando. And the meaning mm. of life is... Uh, you know, much like going commando, it's uh, it's you know finding freedom and happiness, right? It's oh, actually pretty good. I kind of wish I thought of that. Um, before we get into silliness, because I have a feeling it's gonna go very silly. <laughs> you think? I I know. Um, tell us about Adventures Nigh, and tell us like how. So it's interesting. So if people probably familiar with Jack from Red Letter Media, and we are going to get into, pol into Polinko, okay? I, I want to hear all about... The, I, the, think, the... <laughs> I think you mean Plinketto. Plinketto. Legally Sorry, distinct... Plinketto. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Plinketto, <laughs> and hearing of how the board is an absolute nightmare and every pro <laughs> all the problems you've had. And if you've ever even dropped uh, uh, one of the, pe the uh, tokens, because it seems like you're never allowed to do anything on there, I I've, I think I've dropped maybe twice now, okay. so still uh, still underrepresented. But yeah, uh, so where where do you want to start? How do you want to where? Well, how did it come like start? like like what was the idea of like you know oh we're doing video games because even when you're at the escapist it was mostly hmm. video games and then it's like yeah let's just start doing a live play and event you know like and it it seemed. I don't want to say people seemed hesitant in the first season, but it, I don't know if everyone was as committed as they are now. That might be <laughs> me reading into it, watching the well, older episodes, but everyone's really into it now. 
everyone's really into it now the i mean so it my my first idea was uh was actually just an audio only because that's uh you know like i had listened to a few you know i play uh played D and then i'd mm-hmm. listened to a few like actual play podcasts both of D and and from some other systems and i i really enjoy that you know as i'm cleaning the house or whatnot pop that on so my first pitch to uh nicolandra my uh once and future editor-in-chief was oh we'll just get a couple of us together we'll do an audio only really cheap to produce that sort of thing Um, but then as we talked more and more about it, you know, one of, one of our favorite things was when like fans would animate the little sections, uh, from the audio actual plays. And we're like, well, wait, we could probably do that if we use our, our little, you know, our little Yahtzee style. And, uh, with my, uh, you know, kind of co-creator editing partner, Omar, we, we kind of figured it out. Uh, the, the reason why all of the players were so hesitant in that first season is, only one of them had ever really played before. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, and, you know, I had, uh, so uh, Jesse Galena uh, has uh, been playing for a long time, actually uh, made up his own uh, uh, tabletop role-playing system. Oh. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, and I streamed with all of them and, you know, got along with all of them. And so it was just like, oh, well, you know, you want to join me on this. But like Casey, Amy had never played before. Yahtzee had played years ago probably when it was still like 3.5 edition he had played a long long time ago hadn't played anything recently um and so i think that a lot of that was just them going what the hell are we doing (laughs) (laughs) yeah you you, you can see that i mean they were definitely a little bit more hesitant and like almost scared <laughs> i guess it could you were like okay this is what we're gonna do we're gonna be playing a brand new game that none of you know how to play you've never done before live in front of people go <laughs> pretty much is is just like you know well and i it's something we still run into which is just like you know like oh i think my character wants to do this is that okay and it's like well shoot tell me how you're doing it let's go mm-hmm. you know like mm-hmm. Is that hesitance of like coming from a video game background, right? If if your video game character, uh, you know, wants to climb a wall and there's no climb button, then you are not climbing a wall. Mm-hmm. And so I think like getting them, getting everybody over that hurdle of like, no, really, you can attempt to do anything you want at any time. Mm-hmm please go (laughs) and finally here in season three um you know i want to say just a couple episodes ago uh the episode that came out was them putting on a a psychic puppet show for a memory (laughs) eating ooze and it's like yes that's the kind of batshit insane things that can happen when we just play pretend for a couple Mm -hmm. hours (laughs) i I mean you could see it i mean between season one two and three like season three they're fully into the weird like they're really they're they're into it they get it they (laughs) and they've been embracing it (laughs) they've been they've been embracing it so much i think they're starting to make you go in different directions and you can't even anticipate what they're gonna do as i've seen more than once (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, which is, I mean, that's, you know, as, as a uh, fellow game masters, you guys know, like that's when you get to play is when your players surprise you and you go, Oh, Oh, now I get to do something too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't plan for this. Now I can have some fun as well. Yeah. But, uh, hold on. I'm linking out adventures nine to everyone so they can see it. And so it what out. was what was the concept of how did you want to introduce them? Like, what was the first? Because there's Adventures 1, Adventures 2, and now they're Adventure 3. Mm-hmm. And you have a very weird world where you have, was it Princess Beyonce? Uh, uh, first of all, how dare you? <laughs> oh! <laughs> it is... It is Queen Beyonce. Oh, queen. That is Queen, queen, queen You have Beyonce. to get the title right. Well, she I once mean, was Princess a, Beyonce. Well, maybe she daughter. was princess in season one, and now she's queen in season three. I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I mean, first of all, if Beyonce is in any fiction, she is queen. I'm a, a relatively big Beyonce fan in general. Be- like Beyonce being a major part of season three is one of those situations that um, I really didn't think we would get to. Uh, it started off in season one. Uh, it was just a joke. Uh, they found a letter, like a letter signed by all of the royals in hierarchy. And something I'm really proud of 
in Adventures Nigh is my goofy names. I try to come up with as silly a name as possible for every NPC. Um, and so it was uh, the the gag was a series of goofy names and then signed, you know, uh, you know, this goofy name, this goofy name, this goofy name and Queen Beyonce uh, just to kind of, you know, button that joke up. And I thought like, oh, Queen Beyonce, this is never going to come up again. Let's move on with the adventure. And now she is a major part of season three. <laughs> and then uh, which is great. And you also have. um Oh, who's the my favorite character? Um, your little. There's your, so many. No, your little the little the little guy the bread the little um, oh, what's his name? Oob. No, the guy who talks with uh, the the silly voice. Um, oh, oh, cinnamon toasty oh, buns. Yes, cinnamon toasty buns. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Gabarella, one of our players, uh, has been dipping into cleric levels, and so as a cleric, uh, gets to you know summon familiar. And so the familiar she gets to summon is a tiny little uh, gingerbread man named Toasty Cinnamon Br Buns. And uh, and so, yeah, Toasty Cinnamon Buns is there. And I use the uh, the Errol Flynn uh, voice or, the, uh, uh, oh, God, what's it, what's his name? Uh, Snagglepuss. Yes. No one knows uh, who Snagglepuss is. See, you're oh, old. Exit, stage left even. No. <laughs> All right, maybe one person knows. There you go. <laughs> Not and uh, there is a. I want to say I want to say it's Errol Flynn, but that sounds now that I'm no, saying no, it's it, not that Errol is... Flynn. It's um, Lynn, Win, Win. I know Ed Win, Ed Win, yes. Ed Win. Oh, oh, it's up there somewhere. That you know that Ed Win voice of like, oh, Dabarella. Here we are having fun together. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> he is every. I think he's everyone's favorite character. You know that, right? It's like oh, yeah. between the fact that he's animated, he's so funny because he's this little guy. He's got the little arms, and then he's just like bouncing around, and and it just even. I like to see the pictures and see him and find. It's like where's Waldo? I'm like, where is he? Oh, there yes. he is. He's so tiny. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and also very, very Mad Hatter Edwin. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Mad Hatter Edwin. Like I, and, and uh, I was really, uh, it was a coin flip of what voice I would use. It was either going to be Edwin or I was going to go like, um, like you know, dark, you know, uh, dark and smooth. Like, oh, hey there, Deborella. <laughs> like just to be weird because he's a little cinnamon, he's a little gingerbread man. But I think Edwin works better. Someone is saying in the chat, Beyonce fandom is strange to me. She seems like all pop, no strong opinions. Yeah, she is a pop musician. All It should be all pop. Lemonade, one of the greatest albums ever made. Uh, hands down. Could listen to it all day, every day. There you go. Uh, so, what, anyway, so, what, so what was the story <laughs> for so season one? How did you introduce them to the world? And we wanted to talk about this because, and we said it early in the chat, is that I run adventures that go uh for four years where they go start at level one and go to level 20 and you run adventures that have to start and finish in a season of i believe 10 so yeah. you have to plan it out and make sure that there's a beginning middle and end over a period of 10 episodes so how how do you manage and run your and set up your adventures especially for season one versus season two versus season three versus the upcoming season four, because it looks like it's right. been changing quite a bit. It has like, you know, season one and season two, we were shooting via zoom. And so uh, we would actually shoot kind of every other week. One week was a shoot week. Uh, next week for me was a prep week, just kind of like a normal home game. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we had this idea to all get together live. And I think anyone who has watched all the seasons, Oh, pardon me. I was going to burp for a second there. Anyone who had watched all the seasons knows that, like, you know, when performers are at in the same location, when you can talk to each other and kind of react to each other, it just brings that energy. Um, but so how do I prepare? Uh, so, you know, before it was a very standard preparation, like, oh, this, you know, I know what the end goal is and I need to get you to that end goal in 10 to 12 episodes. Right. Right. Um, and so like, I'm doing my best to guide them and not railroad them, but, you know, guide them to the, the final climactic conclusion. What I can say is like for season one and two, they definitely took significantly longer to get to the final conclusion than I thought they would take. 
Um, and so I had to uh, drop several branching plot points that I thought would be more interesting. It's like, fuck it. We got to get right to the big bad right now because <laughs> we got to wrap this up. Mm -hmm. uh, now what I do is I need to be I need to be double prepared for using half of the stuff. Uh, so I need to kind of map out every possibility of where I think they might go. Uh, because uh, the way we play, we use Foundry VTT uh, for all of our playing. And so I, I make the maps. I have to uh, myself and uh, and Omar, uh, you know, kind of the 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 we'll, we'll say the, the co-parent of Adventures and I, we design all the NPCs, we design all the monsters, uh, usually based mm -hmm. off of monsters we find in books, but we design them in our style. And uh, we have to have every single art asset ready before, you know, for the entire 10 episodes, which is stupid. <laughs> it's a stupid way to play. But a lot of that is world building. Like I will spend a, a ridiculous amount of time just kind of figuring out the logistics of my world because I've run a homebrew world. I don't use any. Obviously, our queen is Beyonce, so it's homebrew. <laughs> um, really? Really? <laughs> no, that sounds like the real world to me. I, I know. know. I'm like, yeah, I don't think it's, it's. I don't think it's. Yeah, I think it's like it takes place in this world. <laughs> uh, what uh, I use Foundry VTT. Yes. Uh, and which and, is a, and a we sent you all of our because yeah we do everything on Foundry too and we yeah. are one of their biggest developers and we love Foundry. Well, you use the battles your best, Jerry. Every single thing I gave you the Foundry codes. You won't you. It'll save you so much time. So it'll not, be great. Not only the monster to, you the grab, but you can just put it right in and put the it right picture in. and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's all it's all in there. It's all it's beautiful. In there. So like a lot of my prep work is just in world building because I don't have mm. time. Uh, you know, we uh, in our shooting schedule, it's a one day we shoot two episodes, then we have a day off. You know, then the next day we shoot two episodes, day off, and so on and so forth. So I have a little bit of prep time in between, but most of my time is spent world building like what is the uh, i think they're going to go to this city who is in charge of the city what is their governance like how big a city is it what are some of the major npcs that they're going to run into do i have some voices banks for what these npcs voices are oh uh this npc might connect with this character in this way so that could be a good hook to get them to go here because i really want them to go here mm -hmm. it's it's an absurd amount of pre-planning so that when they do, you know, if they do ever feel directionless as players, which players can, uh, I have a good hook to get them to where I want them to go. Wow. You just described like the golden, like the, uh, the grail of what people jams have been trying to do that forever. It's mm -hmm. like trying to keep their players on track while still having a world. So how do you, <laughs> how do you do that? And Tell me, no. because you have Yahtzee in your party, and it sounds like he doesn't take direction well. <laughs> you know, um, the 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 big thing is consequences, right? Uh, is is uh, for like uh, for example, for season three, uh, they were they were given a task uh, by someone who Yahtzee's character knew from his past. So mm -hmm. we had a personal relationship. Personal relationships, by the way, very powerful. Uh, in any sort of storytelling, uh, my years of improv experience has, has said to always focus on the relationship. So they had a task from someone who had a relationship with a character uh, and the task fed into each of their individual motivations. Right. Uh, for, you know, for Yahtzee, uh, it was it was uh, it's all it's always money uh, for for Sigmar, for KC's character. It's about, you know, uh, righteousness and doing the right thing for Grinderbin. It's about finding weird stuff. Uh, and so I tried to make sure I fed into each one of their desires. And it's like this is the plot hook. But now the extra important thing is if you don't do this plot hook, something is still going to happen. And I actually had this wonderful contingency plan for if they fail. Uh, uh, and and so it's like, oh, if you fail, I get to have a lot of fun and like possibly bad things happen to everything you love. And that <laughs> that like uh, what do you the sword of Damocles, right? Like that hanging over them is so uh, is such good motivation. You actually kind of want them to fail a little bit. 
to be like, hey, consequences are real. <laughs> so. Hmm. So we had some questions. Uh, one person, Chep, said, Adventures and I gave me the push I needed to start GMing a few years ago. You made it all seem simple yet fun. Thanks for that. And yet it's not. It's not simple and fun. It's hard and <laughs> wait, painful. <laughs> wait a minute. It's hard and fun. Okay. Is, like, that's... <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. It's not like, fun at all or simple. <laughs> Now, you know it, it's it's one of those like tabletop role-playing games is one of the few times where as adults we get to just play pretend and like let's just play sure. pretend for a little bit right yeah and be totally an excuse with your friends <laughs> and yeah within and with and not just because if you walked around talking like snagglepuss your friends and family would look at you weird. But here you're like, you can do it, and they're like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> they're all excited. Exactly. Actually, actually, that's not true. Your job at Red Letter, you're pretty weird there, so maybe... Yeah, well, I, I, like I said, fortunately for me, I get to be weird and play pretend a lot yes. in, my, in my several jobs. Yes, that's true. But, you know, like that's the the other part about it and like you know for my home games i i now am to the point because i have so many wonderful modules in foundry like the modules uh, uh like your modules which are all linked in the chat yes. um uh i get to do very little prep for my home games because you know that's more free flow that's more like oh here you're gonna go here i can plop in this module i can plop in this monster we are ready to go and so you know just remember to have fun. It's a game. We're here to have fun. And we have a good question. Is world building can be fun, but also exhausting. How do you keep up your motivation? Especially mm -hmm. for you, because recently, and I was actually curious how you did handle that, because in Adventures 9 Season 3, in like one of the first episodes, they literally went off script, and you actually, like, you could tell you paused it and came back, because you're like, okay, I had to literally build all this stuff, because they went somewhere I didn't expect. And mm -hmm. that's actually one of the downsides of a VTT, is that, you know, obviously, unless you just really start, just say, forget about the VTT, let's just use, uh, you know, Adventure of the Mind. And, yeah. And it's like, okay, we, we got to actually build stuff. And I need like an hour. <laughs> it's like, guys, go get lunch while I build something out, you know? <laughs> so how did that happen? Or what did you do when, when they went off script? Uh, what we have done in the past, uh, uh, because the show is edited, you know, after we film, you know, I do get to edit it. Uh, sometimes what I will do is, uh, within Foundry, actually, uh, we have, a we have a, a dedicated theater of the mind space. That's just a gray room. And I will draw the room, you know, like using the marker tools in Foundry, just be like, okay, you're in this room. Uh, there's something here and I'll just make little scribbles, um, uh, actually, uh, it, during um, a, a recent, we we recently filmed a couple things that all takes place in that gray theater theater of the mind room. Hmm. Um, so that's how we deal with that, uh, and you know, and then I'll make it later. You know, I'll make that asset later, and we can you know cut to us in Foundry later. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, it's uh, hold on. Let me. Uh, I'm trying to uh, remember. Think of the thing that they threw me with uh, in episode. Oh, they visited one. someone that you weren't expecting them to visit. Oh, that's that's right. Uh -huh. they, they visited. Um, they visited uh, a, a, one of my favorite characters, Anus Quiver, uh, who is a, a sea monster that they befriended. <laughs> oh, right, right. Uh, but then, oh yeah, then they visited. Uh, uh, a location from season one, uh, a little trading post that I was legitimately not prepared for. And so like, I actually loaded the wrong map. And so, and I think we talked through it in that episode where it's like, oh yeah, uh, this thing, that is a stove. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all okay. Cause that's part of the fun. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was definitely not prepared for them to want to investigate the kitchen of a trading post that they visited during season one. <laughs> I definitely had to make up a whole bunch of bullshit, uh, which I think as game masters, we get used to making up a whole bunch of bullshit. <laughs> I do find I, it, I think so. Yeah. I do find it interesting because you said you do improv on, mm -hmm. on the side. And I have found that people who do improv, especially professional improv, are 
by far, not always, but they they have a huge leg up. They play. They're usually amazing players mm. and amazing GMs. And I think that's be, right. I think being good at improv, there's a lot of improving when you're GMing and playing. And if you are trained in that, because you can be trained in improv, you will be. I, I, I've I've seen it many times. Uh, there is a Harmon Quest or Harmon Town, if you ever listen to him. And he would have, um, Dan Harmon would have Greg Proops on and mm-hmm. all the guys from this line, you know, whose line is it anyhow. Sure. And it was like, it was like a TED talk. It was like, oh my God, these guys don't even know what they're doing and they're amazing. You know, they're, they, they don't even know the rules. They don't even know what they, to them, it's just improv. You know, it's like, oh, it's improv and I'm a character. That's all it is, you know. Oh, and there's rules and there's dice roll. Yeah. Fine. You know, the fu- and they're fun in- fact, incredible. Dan Harmon got his comedy start in Milwaukee at the comedy theater that I currently work at. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, really? So. I love Dan Harmon. Just, uh, just uh, I've never, uh, I've heard good things about Harmon Quest. I've never listened to it, unfortunately. <gasps> but I, I do, I do comedy sports, which is you know short form game based improv, and that's where Dan Harmon got his comedy start. Wow. Um, ages ago here in Milwaukee. But that's just a little fun side tangent. Like the, it's it's a lot of the same rules, like improv and and role playing. You know, tabletop role playing. It's a lot of the same rules and ideas of of active listening. And trusting all of the people that you're with to support you, Mm -hmm. Uh, whether whether that's like, you know, rules based where it's like, hey, we all we do need to take five minutes so I can look up this rule. Or if it's just like you have to trust me that like for the I'm going to do something for the good of the game. Hmm. Uh, You might not like it, but this is for the good of the game and and, you know, active listening and yes, anding uh, that sort of that sort of uh mentality but one of my favorite uh ideas that is both improv and uh tabletop gaming is the idea of uh coming in with an idea but then being willing to drop that idea Mm. there have been several times where where i have had an encounter all planned out but then i hear my players um and i won't say where this is in adventures nigh or my home games but like I've had this, I've had a map uh, beautifully made. I've had uh, enemies ready to go. And then I hear my players say, oh, you know, uh, here's what I bet is going to happen. And then they like explain something that is a way better idea. <laughs> and so I quick make that idea in the background. <laughs> that's that's pretty standard, though, but it's it's yeah. good. Man, you're giving us like a uh, you're giving us a TED talk on GMing. Man, it's this is like really no, this is very good stuff. Even your like the way you've been running and build it and and how you're so flexible. This is really interesting. <laughs> like, I mean, people always talk about the fact that there's a lot of crossover between improv and GMing, absolutely. and so like yes, and is a common thing that people bring over, mm-hmm. but. Um, that's where you start being like, well, stop. Don't say no so much. Try yes and. But then eventually, when you get more advanced, you realize, okay, you can't always do a yes and. Though. You can, right, right. Sometimes you need to do a yes but or a no but. When yeah. they ask for something that is just so obviously not going to fly, but you can give them something that's close to what they want. So it's like, no, but I will yes. give you this. Where they're like, <laughs> if I have a... A wand of fireball. So could I just use that to automatically kill the demon god with the fireball? And you're like, well, you know, the demon god of fire is immune to fire, and a fireball wouldn't be enough to kill the demon god. But he likes fire items, so maybe, maybe you could like uh, offer the wand of fireball to the demon god, and it won't attack you. So it's similar to, in the sense that you get out of the fight. Like, what do you think about that? So you can try some of those improv techniques, and it works great for GMing. Well, I think that's like one of the hardest things, especially for uh, players who haven't been playing, is just trying to figure out what it is they want. What do you want from this situation? What does your character want, right? Because then you can do that thing where it's like, okay, well, you want to, you know, kill the, you want to end the encounter with the fire god, um, but you obviously can't kill it with a fireball. How can we work together? And just keeping that open communication where it's like, we're going to work together, we're going to figure this out, and that's that like that's that trust, that's that I've got your back mentality, where we are going to find the stupidest and most fun conclusion to this. <laughs> yeah, 
It's all fun. It's all good fun. Someone asked, how does one start learning improv? Uh, you, uh, you, you learn it by the way you learn anything, in my opinion, which is by doing it a whole bunch. Uh, my guess is you are somewhere near a theater that is teaching some sort of improvisation. It's all over the country. Improv is relatively ubiquitous in major cities, at least. Oh, oh, sorry. Burp again. Coffee. <laughs> too much coffee, too much grapefruit juice. Um, and you just keep doing it. You just keep doing it. You just keep taking classes and then you just keep performing and keep performing and keep performing. And uh, the most important thing you can do is uh, listen to the critiques that you get and try your best to implement those critiques. But you would recommend uh, actually taking an improv class, like a real class. Say that again? You would recommend actually taking an improv class as opposed to just trying to teach yourself, like on the internet or something. Oh, yeah. I, I Like improv is one of those, is, is one of those you need to be with another person. Correct. Like, because that's it. It's all about... The back and forth between you and another human. Um, I I took improv classes uh, both uh, when I was in high school. I did improv, and then years later, I started taking classes again as an adult. Fell in love with it and got hired on at my theater. Yeah, I I took improv no. and I took acting, and I remember the first thing they said to me in the acting class was, "This is one of the only um, professions or hobbies or whatever you want to call it or you know activities that you need an audience." That you actually need to have someone to do it in front of. Otherwise, you're just sure. doing it by yourself. And I never thought about it. I'm like, actually, you're right. You can't just do this. I mean, sure, you can act by yourself, but you actually need an audience. And I always thought about that. So it's not something you can easily do by yourself. Yeah, is... that like there's a lot you can do to train muscle memory without mm -hmm. an audience. Like if, if it's just you and your team, you and your group together to be like, to, to work on those communication skills, but until you are in front of an audience and you know what they are laughing at, yeah, you don't know what you're doing. But yeah, find a class. Go take a class. Uh, they can be a lot of fun. Um, they can be very frightening uh, for people who don't, uh, who aren't comfortable with performing. I know several people who take classes with us at comedy sports, um, uh, which is you know short form game based improv. Where we have a, it's an eight week course, seven weeks of classes, and then one like showcase show. And I've seen several people do the seven weeks of classes, and then they say they don't want to do the show. Like I'm not here for the show. I just kind of want to learn something. I don't want to perform in front of anyone. Hmm. And I think that's that's fine and respectable. Well, yeah, and improv, but improv is all about isn't it taking suggestions and going with. I mean, I guess you could do improv from each other, especially once the setting is set. But isn't it the whole idea to like sort of get the whole setup from the audience and then go with sometimes, sometimes, yeah. but not always. The you know, generally speaking, um, both long form and in short form, we get a suggestion from the audience. Sometimes that suggestion is just uh, an occupation one of your parents had. Oh, a farmer. Okay, this scene is about a farmer. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. we we get a little more information where it's like, oh, you know, tell me about. Uh, the weird thing that happened to you today. Okay, now we're going to base that story off, you know, a scene off of that. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, again, you know, thinking about like the the bridge between improv and uh, tabletop role playing games, one of the first things you learn in improv scene work is establishing the base reality, setting up the who, the what, and the where. And as we know as game masters, how incredibly important is that to your players? Where where you say you know, like, okay, you're in a room. Go do something. And they're like, wait, is there anybody in the room? Is, you know, what's the context? What about, uh, what's in the room? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what can I see? That sort of like setting up the base reality for every scene that your players interact with so they know what they can play with. Is this the same thing? It's the same thing. Improv with math. That's tabletop role-playing games. <laughs> <laughs> So we did get a super chat. Yeah, we did for 50, I think, Argentine pesos. Um, during a game, what do you feel about a solution that works but is so complex it will be difficult to execute or take too long? Also, hi, Jack. Hi, Eric. 
<laughs> uh, Eric is one of our wonderful uh, moderators uh, uh, who's also helping us out on uh, social video, Bob, a, and a very important member of the Second Wind team. Mm. Hello, Eric. I appreciate you being here. Ringer. Uh, you basically, <laughs> I bring some ringers, uh, and I appreciate that, Hi, Eric. Uh, okay, so we just did uh, the uh, so complex that it will be difficult to execute. So uh, I had talked already about the psychic puppet show. Uh, my players came up with a plan to put on a psychic puppet show. So that puppet show could be viewed by Cinnamon Toasty Buns, and then the memory sucked out of Cinnamon Toasty Buns of only the puppet show uh, to be fed to a memory-eating villain, right? That was their plan. And so then, that's very complex. That's very complex, and that's not a standard thing. So then as a game master, the thing you are hoping to set up is the drama, the tension. At what point during this would be uh, what are the elements that are the most dramatic and then those are the dice rolls right like and, and you know mark I, maybe you can speak to this more as you know someone who has actually written rules <laughs> i make up rules but you actually write down rules which is very more important <laughs> <laughs> hey but you like, know what it's equally important um the end user who's making up the rules at the table to the <laughs> like it's a dialogue it's not one that's usually actually had in person like we can have now, but it's a sort of dialogue where the designer writes down the rules and yeah. then the, the GM like uses that in person. And so like uh, when when you're making a rule for a mechanic, a mechanic that you're making up, are you thinking about like the tension moment like or like what are you thinking of like what makes the decision of when you roll a die? Like that to me is the important part because that's the tension in a tabletop game is mm. like something is going to happen and you will pass fail or somewhere in between. How do you figure out that moment? That's a very good question, which shows <laughs> that you are thinking a little bit like a game designer because many game designers have a fundamental like question and answer to that question as part of their game system especially for smaller indie games where like up front and center they make sure to tell you mm -hmm. hey look there's a lot of things that don't even require a role they just work <laughs> yeah yeah um so it depends on what system you want to play and a system that's going to be a little crunchier might have roles for just a lot of things so that you can feel like you didn't quite make it through things just automatically or by rote. Whereas more cinematic systems will just be like, if it's not interesting, just, you know, hand wave it past. And when you get to, <laughs> when you get to anything where it's like, this will be interesting if they don't make it. Yeah. Then only if you can come up with an interesting um, consequence in a lot of systems, now D and D is not exactly those systems, but in a lot of systems, they'll be like only roll if you have an interesting consequence, right? And usually, one in those systems where you can fail forward, which is fail forward, always also a very good improv um, technique to have when you have a chance of failing. Like I guess in normal improv, you're not rolling a die, and like you just decide whether they succeeded or not through like a negotiation or something. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's very similar to just making a, a in a in an improv scene in a comedy improv scene. Usually, you never want to fix a problem. You you always want to make a problem worse because that's usually funnier. But you also want to make big decisions, and so like that's so like for the psychic puppet show, that was my big that was my big complicated moment where it's like okay, well. You know, we need this could be this could be a point of failure. So this will be a dice roll. And then this could be a point of failure. So this is a dice roll. And then we'll we'll figure out where that works. Um, we recently shot something. Um, my players got a, a large amount of platinum uh, during season two. It, it broke down to about 112 pounds of platinum each, which is a ridiculous amount of money. I think it, it boiled down to like 56,000 gold pieces which is, you know, a world-breaking amount of money to give any player. Uh, and so we needed to resolve what they were going to do with this amount of platinum. And one of my players knew where they wanted to end up. At the end of the day, I want this item, which does not exist in the world, that will be absolutely mind-bendingly game-breaking, <laughs> which was 
you know, it, it was it was like Eric said, it was so complex that I want to say it took us three hours in a one on one role play session just to figure out, well, OK, if you want X at the end of the day, first, we need A and B and C. And then here's the roles and here's the roles and here's the roles. Um, and so what do you do uh, for a solution that's too complex is you make big decisions <laughs> and talk to the players, which is, I don't know, maybe that's like the, the lamest answer, but it's, it's always better to make a big decision, even if it's the wrong decision, because at least you're moving. <laughs> yeah. I think Jack's right. If you get stuck, it's a problem. And even if something yeah. seems like it's too complicated, the secret is just like when someone's making a movie or a TV show, there are ways that you can decide where you're showing the frames and skip mm -hmm. forward and move past. Like on old shows, they would always show you like someone arriving in the car or something like that. And they like, get out and they go in. Whereas yes. in a modern show to save you time and to fit more in into the slot, they'll just cut and they'll be at the place that they were going to <laughs> by the time it gets back. It may switch to some other character, maybe not. But right. they're there. And in a similar way, if the plan seems too complex because of some of these smaller aspects, but you don't feel like you have time to deal with it, maybe you could just skip some of the complex part and say, like, well, you know what? Yeah, there was something with setting up this psychic puppet show and doing the like the promos and getting people to come to it that probably was pretty complicated. But we'll just quickly do one role for that and see and how yeah. if it's high, then a lot of people came. If it's low, not as many people came. And we'll skip to the puppet show because we all wanted to see <laughs> you doing this puppet show. And like maybe that's a way to cut the Gordian knot. Yeah, I I think like that's also like a really uh, again that bridge between improv and role play, right? Where it's like if you are ever in a situation both role play and improv rise where you feel the energy dying down and you're like, "Oh, what I I've, I'm trapped in here and we're not really doing anything and I'm not having fun." Cut. Just, "Hey, guess what? We're going to move forward. Uh you won. Great. Now here's what's next. Let's keep it interesting. <laughs> keep your attention." Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Mhm. Mm so tell us about your home game, because I hear that Rich Evans. Oh no, I said his name. Is he going to appear as a like Beetlejuice? <laughs> <laughs> Is in your home game? <laughs> uh, I have a I have a couple of home games that I run. Oh, a couple. Uh, oh man, couple. whoa! I it's it's a heck of a hobby. Um, uh, you know, like one of the home games I run is for like my kid and some uh, friend and and their kids, and you know, it's it's more child friendly, and mm -hmm. we're just kind of introducing them to the concept of of role playing and and how much you know fun it can be to you know come up with plans. Um, one of uh one of my home games is with is with Rich and a few other friends. Uh, but you know, uh, Rich is a person uh, who has never really played before, has never really played Dungeons and Dragons before. And so, you know, we're definitely taking it very slow. Um, uh, it's uh, a couple people, it's their first time playing. Rich already, uh, it, he's very Yahtzee like in his playing, where he is already looking to break everything and he gets very excited when he thinks he's getting away with something. <laughs> May I ask what he's playing? Uh, he is playing, he's playing a thief. Uh, he is playing a rogue. Uh, so he's, he's going full, uh, full sneaky thief and loves every minute of it. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, I, I, I run a couple home games. They don't always, you know, run regularly cause mm -hmm. schedules always change, but, but I, I always enjoy it. And then, um, the one thing I'm trying to get together right now is, so mostly I play uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Because that's just the system I know. Uh, I've been trying very hard to get a Monster of the Week session together. Because mm. uh, that's a, a system I've enjoyed before. I have played uh, with some internet friends, some Pathfinder 2E, uh, just to learn the system and, you know, figure out that there's, you know, obviously uh, benefits to all different, all sorts of different systems. So I've played a fair bit of systems, but most of my time is with, uh, is with 5th edition D&D. Mm. So... So yeah. we have a question here. Is, oh, what did they ask? Jack, you've probably been asked this too many times already, but when did you start playing TTRPGs? Sure. Uh, relatively not that long ago uh, is the is the answer to that. Uh, like, I've probably only been playing regularly for the past 
five, six years. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a, a newbie <laughs> by, by most people's standards. Um, maybe seven years. I, it's hard to, it's hard to remember. Uh, but uh, really, it just started where with a uh, a friend of mine was running an actual play podcast that I listened to and enjoyed. And they said, well, uh, they were playing uh, masks, the 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 power back apocalypse uh, superhero masks uh, mm-hmm. thing. And they said, well, you know, come on and join us. And, you know, like, we'll teach you how to play this system. Uh, and it was such an absurd amount of fun. Uh, where it's like, I get to play pretend and there's rules. Oh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, just kept playing, kept playing. Uh, I didn't know anyone who was running a game. So it's like, well, fuck it. Now I got to learn how to run a game so that I can play it, uh, which is the best way to get a group together. Is just you have to run it. And then I found a bunch of people who uh, who would play with me here and there. And it was great. And I have a, we have a, now the questions are coming in. Ask Jack why he plays D&D. Instead of the greatest TTRPG of all time, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Well, that was not a completely biased question or anything <laughs> in chat. I, I am simply the moderator. I... You're, oh, People yeah. in chat are just so superlative. There's another one in here talk, calling something the greatest human alive. Well, we'll get to we'll that get one. To next. That, one's, that one's by the same person. They seem to have very strong opinions. But that one I, I might agree with. But so... But, I think, you, but like, you have been interested in Pathfinder. Are you starting to get interested? Oh, a hundred percent. I think like at the time and probably still now, um, uh, there there's more. Obviously, like you know, D and D is is the big kid. Uh, it's the lar- It's the largest person in this space, and therefore there's the most amount of resources as far as learning it. Uh, secondly, is uh, you know, I am from Wisconsin, the the birthplace of Dungeons and Dragons. So you know, gotta give a little bit of respect to, to the Gygax, mm-hmm. um, uh, which I I also understand that Pathfinder technically was uh, you know is like the stepchild of <laughs> <laughs> of D and D as it was birthed off of uh, three point five. But, but you're right that D and D is the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room. Oh, yeah. it, it is, of course, it so, of like, course is. If you're and and you know, let's be honest. Most role play, most tabletop role playing games are rules heavy. There's a lot of rules to learn, and so then it's just like, well, who's going to point me to, you know, to learning the rules? Oh, okay. Well, there's more Dungeons and Dragons, so that's the way I went. I've been uh, getting a lot more into Pathfinder, uh, obviously during the whole open games license debacle. Um, there was, you know, big talks and, and I, you know, bought a bunch of, oh, I'm going to pronounce their name wrong. Piazzo. 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 I bought, you know, bought a bunch from Piazzo. Um, got really love. And this is something you and I have talked about is like, I love their character creation. I love kind of the, the flexibility in Pathfinder 2E's character creation. I also love the three point, uh, action system. Way better system than anything D&D has ever had. Obviously, 2E, Pathfinder 2E, a little more complicated, uh, a little more rules heavy. Uh, All I need to do is say one word here, and everyone will agree with me, which is shields. Okay, Mark, who wrote the damn thing. (laughs) Or <laughs> co-wrote the damn system. What do, you, are what, do you, what do you have to say about that, Mark? <laughs> did you make shields too? That, that, did you I make shields, shields too complicated, Mark? <laughs> so I do want to say, when it comes to one thing, is that I actually do agree with a lot of things Jack said, but I think I'm going to disagree that most tabletop RPGs, by number of tabletop RPGs, are very rules heavy. Oh. By playtime and popularity, yes. <laughs> Only because D D is also by playtime and popularity has like probably eight, somewhere between eighty and ninety percent of all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but by actual, if you count the systems, I would say the vast majority of systems are actually rules light, of sure. which they are incredibly indie, and very few people have heard of them. <laughs> right? If you you see what I mean, though, right? I will. I will one hundred percent agree with you on that. I. But but I think but if Pathfinder gonna... is is rules heavy and shields are a little more complex but I <laughs> I do feel that it's worth it by a significant amount because I'm, it makes a playing a character shields. who's sword and board yeah feel more different because you're actively doing things you get not only armor class benefit but 
you can like uh, prevent damage that's coming your way and it makes it feel mm -hmm. more like a different fighting style than two have been fighting in two-handed so i would say undoubtedly it is more complicated because you're doing a thing instead of not having to do a thing you're right but i think it's worth it in this case and I, like that's that's like always the trade-off right where it's like yeah you're if if you are a shield user which by the way in all games in video games in role-playing games i am a shield user i love shields uh in general and so it's like okay uh it, within pathfinder 2e not only do you have a shield it is useful and used in combat uh, extensively which is wonderful but if you get hit by it uh, you have to deduct the hardness level by the ac of the shield which will then uh be deducted to your or uh, added to your ac and it, it it needs a rule to make it useful but it adds a rule <laughs> no you're absolutely right i do feel this is one of the additions of D, &D or pathfinder one of those D, &D likes mm. that has the shield user being relatively a, like a really good pick for characters yeah. compared to in a lot of others where it's just like well you lose so much damage i don't know if i want to do that um in in some other editions but you're right uh we actually in the play test had a slightly simplified more simplified version where the shield just took dents after the hits yeah, yeah, yeah. but people were just like that's too like cut and dry where it's just like one dent or two dents i don't like it where like if it takes even one more damage than the threshold that it gets a dent i'd rather have it be granular with hit sure. points yeah. and we were like are you sure because it's easier with dents i'm telling you <laughs> that it's easier with dents and if it's more granular it could mean that getting hit by a really really big hit really clobbers your shield so whereas the dents you always could take like a certain number of dents before it broke so worst case scenario you still didn't destroy it in one yeah, hit yeah and people are like no the playtests are like we promise you we want the the hit points <laughs> on the shield and i think that maybe if uh now after these years some people are looking back at the playtest and being like maybe we should have listened to them and gone with dents <laughs> um like i don't know like oh, it's, right. it's well, possible and it's like you know no matter, I think no matter what system, I, I might be in the minority of tabletop role player, player players. Uh, and I think rules are beneficial to the system. I think when you have goals as far as character uh, upgrades, when you have rules so you know where you can play in between, it makes that play more fun. Uh, I have played systems with Incred an incredibly low amount of rules and i feel like i have a little less fun because i'm doing more work uh where it's like oh i know what i have to do here oh i can be sneaky i can be tactical with my within my rules uh which is why like to me i will always talk about pathfinder 2e mostly because of that three action uh that three action point rule which that was my biggest thing i know i've i've told you about this before but i will tell the live chat is as soon as I started learning Pathfinder 2E and I realized that if you stand still, no matter your class, you can attack again. Obviously, you have uh, you have your multi-attack uh, penalty, but you can attack again. I was like, that's what I wanted in Dungeons and Dragons. I was like, I'm not moving. You mean I can run 30 feet, but I can't swing my dang sword again? That's bullshit. <laughs> so as soon as I found out that rule exists within Pathfinder, I was like, oh, this is phenomenal. This is, this is great. And if you're a rogue and you level up, you can move and attack. Ooh, there you go. As, you can uh, do some combo moves. You can. You can so, combine the two. <laughs> Jack, I think that you, I guess, like me and like some of the other players who are in the chat here, are more of a restrictions breed creativity yeah whereas absolutely. there are some people who are like restrictions get in the way of my fantasy and it, they're both very viable viewpoints to take yeah. but um in some ways for some of us like if you could just do anything or mostly anything and it's not kind of walled off it's hard to decide how much to ask for and you can yeah. always either ask for the moon or feel that what you got maybe was like not as earned because nice. you were allowed to ask for anything. Whereas if you have restrictions <laughs> and you know 
where those boundaries lie, it can sometimes be building blocks that you can use to create something. Absolutely. It's it's that focus, right? It's like, I, I want a direction to be pointed in. Now, how I get there, I can have some fun with, but at least I know where I'm going. Uh, yeah, I've, I've played some, like even, even playing uh, Monster of the Week or, uh, or Masks, where they don't necessarily have an initiative system. Um, as a game master, I use initiative a lot of times just to settle my players down, where it's like everybody's talking over each other, roll initiative so everyone gets to talk one at a time. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, I think stuff like that is really, are, are really important tools. So yeah, I, I'm a I'm a rules are cool kind of guy. <laughs> nice. Wow. Have you seen rules Pathfinder's cool. um victory point subsystems like the influence system? Because that actually even codifies sort of what you were doing there by having um little mini games where you do a round robin. It's not a combat, but people could either roll initiative or just decide what order they go in. And each person gets to do something. And, and you're like, well, this is for the next half hour or, or um you're at a big party. You have to influence nobles. You don't have enough time to just have who I don't know who your like yackiest player is who would just talk <laughs> over everyone and do everything uh, if they could. So yeah. since people are talking about Rich a lot in the chat, let's say that it was him. And be like, well, Rich might want to talk to all ten of the nobles, but he can't because it takes a half hour to talk to one of them. Yeah. With a... So Rich goes here, and each <laughs> each person goes to a different noble yeah. and they might talk or maybe they're not good at talking to them but they can use diplomacy or talk about an interest like oh the wizard only knows about magic but that's okay because this one person is the chancellor of the academy and you can talk about magic with them they're a big nerd or other characters could just scope out and be like i'm gonna watch this person to see what they like and dislike so that the others will get an advantage when talking to them and that's something that Pathfinder has these uh, built in that is built to the same instinct you had for using yeah. structure in um, something. I love that. Like the other thing, if we're if we're just going to talk about the things we like about Pathfinder, because there there is so much I do like about it, um, is the their their lore system. Like instead of just general history checks, it's like no 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 no, you need to know lore if you're going to make that kind of check. And I I love that in the game that I played with my internet friends. Uh, that was one of the things that they kept asking for in level up is like, wait, can I get this lore? Cause I think like I would. And, and we used that lore system to grow their characters and to like really help define in the role play side of it, who their character was, which I think is phenomenal. It's awesome. that melding of role play and rules. I'll give you a secret about that, which is that normally you have to use your like skill increases or take the additional lore skill feed to get lowers, but yeah. Uh, advanced GM tip is that you can give like some kind of minor lore that's not like hugely impactful as a reward for someone engaging in your world that's just on top of their usual build. Hmm. It's like, you know what? I might have given you a magic item or something else, but I'm actually going to say you, you've been spending so much time at this bar that you want to set up, uh, whatever, <laughs> yeah. looking at the different things you can import and export. I'm going to give you alcohol lore and you just have alcohol lore now and you can just add that in as a reward and wow. and then your players like again like thinking about that like melding between like rules and role play where it's like now a player has an incentive to be like i would like okay i'm at a party now i would like to roll with my alcohol lore uh, to <laughs> to see who's drinking the most expensive stuff oh <laughs> and then you would be like if you're doing the influence system you'd be like hey you know what normally i was going to ask for perception to figure out Mm -hmm. more information to tell your party members. I'm going to let you use alcohol lore and you can figure out this person's got the best <laughs> um, the best liquor and now you know if, that you might people might want to talk to them about alcohol or try to ply them with expensive liquors as a gift um, or figure some something out that way. Yeah. No, and I, I like like a, that, that's that's an example like that's a very specific example of like the rules being uh, a launching pad where it's like if if they didn't have that like lore rule if they didn't get extra points for that they might not have thought to be that creative they were just like ah i don't know who's who's looks the who looks the the richest and then you know the gm makes a role like oh yeah you see who's the richest that's kind of bland that's not fun in my in my opinion obviously everybody plays different but like you know the bouncing that's that's where i'm 
that's where I'm at. I like that. I like that. All right. I like you guys. This is great. <laughs> so we have a ton of questions. Everyone wo- came out of the oh, woodwork yeah. suddenly. So I'll try to go through the quick. Okay. And now we're starting to get into some red letter media. So one question is, I recall Mike telling a D&D war story in one of the, um, <laughs> one of the red letter medias. Does he still play? I actually remember that too. He mentions it once in a while, but it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. Um, and uh, what, as far as I am aware, he, uh, like he might have a secret D&D game that I'm not aware of. God. But as far as I know, he does not play anymore. I think he literally he just played that one time and unfortunately, uh, you know, did very well as a player to where his dungeon master got really upset with him. This is the story he tells. Mm. And he, and so he kind of lost his taste for it because he had a bad interpersonal experience that story is the most common story of why people stop playing i hear that story all the time it's very very common my my first time playing was a little after high school a buddy of mine very good friend of mine uh you know big big dnd player invited me to his group um and the rest of his group were so off-putting to me. They did not want the burden of teaching a new player how to play that like I felt I felt like I needed to leave, even though I was invited to this house. Mm. Uh, and yeah, it it put me off on the on the hobby for years just because like there wasn't a welcoming environment, mm-hmm. which, you know, again, going back to why D D, it's because like the, that was what was available is like oh most of the youtube videos you watch explaining rules were D D related most of the actual plays were D D actual plays so that's that's the community that comes from that gatekeeping is real and it is uh is an issue even like they might not have been intending to keep you out of things they might have just been maybe negligent of the fact that they needed to reach out an extra hand to a newbie and just been like, Oh, we can just keep going. He'll catch up. He'll figure it out and still left you behind. Maybe they were actively being like, I don't know. I don't like having this Jack guy here. Like, but either way, the end result was the same was that it made you bounce a little bit. Yeah. And so like, I, I guess that's, that's now our responsibility for those of us who are in the hobby is to make sure that, and that's why I, I personally love running games with new players to kind of show them the fun you can have. The The one thing I do regret, though, like, you know, thinking of Adventure is Nine, is I want to say I started everybody, I started everybody at level three. Mostly because that's when, you know, you get like a lot of superpowers. It starts at level three. And I wanted everyone to have like the best time possible so it's like okay if you start at level three you have more tools to play with uh but i do wish i would we would have had a real like low level adventure just to wet uh wet their palate uh so that was one of the the things that was like oh this will make it easier for them to get into dungeons and dragons this will give them a little power right away but i think and it, obviously it worked eventually, but I, I really think that if you can uh, 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 carve out a good low level, low power adventure, that's what that'll get people hooked uh, better. We have another question opinion. is uh, Jack, what does it feel like to be friends with the greatest human alive, Rich Evans? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, oh, it did. It. Uh, it it uh it lifts my heart every day every time i see it <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's very fortunate uh i i i get to work with people whom i enjoy outside of work and that's always very nice <laughs> is uh my question is is rich evans character as big of a klutz as he is <laughs> on the show is he always walking around breaking everything and <laughs> no no he's rich is very good at you know uh boobery as yes. at buffoonery buffoonery uh no i i think actually like in real uh, uh one in real life you know rich does not uh bump into things and i think that's why in the game we play i think that's why he wanted to play a thief is so he could be you know cat and stealthy oh, and the opposite and... <laughs> i see i don't know whenever i watch those videos of him like just knocking everything it makes me it makes me anxious i feel i feel so bad i'm like oh what a mess i mean he's the one who's got to clean it up oh really i don't oh, feel yeah. so bad anymore now. I thought he that knows was what like, he's doing he just like leaves he's like intern fix this 
<laughs> intern Snope. We we are in front of and behind the cameras. Usually, uh, all the people you see uh, in a video are also the people running the cameras beforehand. <laughs> right. All right. I don't feel nearly as bad now. Now I know that no. he has to clean up his own mess. <laughs> uh, we have, um, let's see. What is your opinion? Oh, this I got to know. This is a good one. Oh. <laughs> What's oh. your opinion of the D&D movies? Oh, boy. Here we go. We can turn this into red letter media right here. Now, now. <laughs> let's get into uh, it. <laughs> can't I love both for very different reasons? <laughs> no, we just said, what's your opinion on the D&D oh, movies? Okay. What do you think would make a good one? Um, uh, no, I think uh, with the new one, um, the, oh, what's it, Thieves... Uh, Honor okay. among things. Honor, Honor among things. things. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I think yeah. like the new one, I thought did a really good job of like kind of poking at the tropes of of a tabletop, uh, while also like just being a good adventure. Because at the end of the day, that's that's all we're hoping for with any of these games is a little escapism, is a little adventure to go on. And I think they did a really good job uh, in Honor Among Thieves uh, of of bridging that gap between like hey everybody knows that the bard just failed a roll here and we get to show that in a really funny way mm -hmm. um uh which is great uh the old D, D movie is obviously something very very special i think jeremy <laughs> irons uh jeremy irons uh, deserves an award for the amount of effort he gave for that crappy crappy movie you know, I, uh, it's very often people will say like Nicolas Cage is a phenomenal actor because he gives 110% no matter the script. And I think Jeremy Irons goes so ham as the villain in the old D&D &D movie. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> I, I, I mean, it. I've been on record that new D&D &D movie. They, they I don't think it's possible for them to actually make one that was better. Like that was probably as good as it'll ever get because everyone right? was really into it the story was good the special effects were good they got yeah and the everything like the in jokes you got to see like when people fail things you recognize the spells you recognize <laughs> and and yeah. it was just done with seriousness and like reverence to the material i was like and it looked great and uh, and, well, and you it, know it did fine it did okay it did it, did, it did, okay. did okay you know like obviously when it came out we're and even still now we're still like uh, we're movies in general are still recovering from that like post covid right people got used to not going to see movies right right, right. um but like they boiled it down to the core which is uh, like a buddy comedy is like mm -hmm. here's the different archetypes of characters going on an adventure isn't it weird that all of these characters are together and that for most of our fantasy tabletop experience is the fun mm -hmm. is the bard trying to talk to a barbarian trying to deal with a wizard <laughs> like all of that fun stuff the old movie i don't even the i would love a little a little documentary about how that stupid thing got made because it know? was Huh? I can tell you right now. You want the documentary? <laughs> well, I know. I know how it got made. I understand the reasons why it got oh, made. Oh right, right. That a but kid, like, like a twenty-year-old kid, walked in and got the rights and decided to make a D and D movie, and that's basically it. <laughs> like, but the how could no one involved in that movie care about the source material in any way? It's so cheap. It's so bad. It is so flippant. <laughs> with the source material because i would think in all seriousness that was also still when you know obviously mid-range movies were still a thing and dvds mm. and, and yeah. cd-rom sales uh sorry, sorry you know like dvds and um vhs sales were a big part of the money that they were make and they're like look it'll go it'll come out and then we'll make the money back on sci-fi network usa network and you know dvd and vhs sales and they probably did that's the whole joke is <laughs> as bad as that movie was they probably made their money back yeah they might have they probably did and because that <laughs> was part of the formula and mm -hmm. nowadays these movies really have to stand on their own like you can you know that's all gone well that's the that stuff's gone mid-range movies are gone you know so yeah, yeah. if you're not a good movie 
that's it. <laughs> you'll be not only will you not exist, but they will no longer put you on streaming, and you will never be seen again by anyone. There will be no cold. Not following. just if you're not a good movie. If you're not a good movie that's already part of an established franchise, right. then you're gone forever. Yeah, you're gone forever. R.I.P. The Empty Man. Oh, beautiful movie and beautiful horror movie. If you haven't seen it, Which you one? can't you can't necessarily see it because it's all off of streaming services now. Which one? Which one? It's called The Empty Man. Uh, I was on HBO Max for a bit. Oh. Uh, beautiful movie I, it might have come to amazon i think but for a while like it was just one of those several deleted movies that Ugh. wouldn't exist yeah but yeah. uh but you know it's 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 funny and you know like it's the same thing i'm a big uh big comic book uh, fan uh you know Mm -hmm. uh, have uh, you know, my collection here and we we saw the same growing pains with comic book movies is you know like not quite getting it oh we maybe got something oh they have now like fully formed fully gest jaded and I think we saw the same thing with the D and D movie. What did we watch the other day? We just oh we rewatched Clue, the Clue movie. <gasps> Mark, we were just talking about literally Clue yesterday. Yesterday, Steven yesterday was talking about it. I was talking. We had a stream about <laughs> mystery and occult, and I was telling the young lady who's. 26 so she hasn't seen mm -hmm. anything uh to see two movies i gave her she had to see is murder by death and clue and i said you have to see these two movies and like, they, clue is 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 a very fun movie it's a very weird movie it's very but weird. It, it also like it's not necessarily about the board game clue no. which i think is very very funny um but that's the kind of thing where it's like well we'll take this property and we'll kind of make a movie out of it or you could actually make a movie about what makes that property interesting mm -hmm. you could make a clue movie that's an actual murder mystery instead right. of a mad camp uh comedy it's like the mad 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 world of uh murder mystery <laughs> movies basically that's what it kind of was that's fair that's fair uh, so, you, so, uh, yeah. you know the producer my brother is friendly with him the producer of the D, D movie was he was also one of the architects for the marvel universe phase one he actually oh, started oh, okay. on that which is sure. i think why they brought him on board but you could see a lot of that like he actually one of the things about the phase one is that they were able to bring comic books and this weird esoteric very insulated concept to the mainstream mm -hmm. and they pretty much did that with the new D and D movie. I think the biggest issue yeah. was that a COVID, so it it probably would have made way more money you know, oh, pre COVID. Yeah. And two, they spent a lot. They spent 150 million on it, which really isn't that much compared to what everyone else was spending. But it was too much <laughs> for them to make money. You know what I mean? Like oh right, right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, like the it's it's that what we've what we've discovered as far as like kind of fantasy movies in general, comic books, D and D, fantasy in general, is you need that balance of like of of whimsy and reality. Is is that base reality? Mm -hmm. You know, where I think if you get too whimsical, people check out, and if you get too Nolan esque people uh, check out, and so you have to find that fun balance where. We're going to take ourselves seriously, but maybe not all the time. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk. We actually have one more question. Jack, have you ever used the BOTW schlock as inspiration for your games? Um, uh, there is. Uh, have I ever used best of the worst schlock as inspiration for my games? Uh, I A couple characters definitely are named after. Um, uh B movie actors or uh or their characters uh there's a character coming up that's a rothrock uh, named after cynthia rothrock mm -hmm. um uh, who you know be a b movie royalty as far as i am concerned so but uh you know it's 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 a lot of uh, i take schlock very seriously and that's how that's the thing i like because i i like bad movies like legitimately i enjoy watching them mm -hmm. because they're very fun especially when they go off the rails and so it's it's that idea i try to keep that schlock idea in mind when i'm running a game mm -hmm. of just like you're gonna try something really stupid let's see if it works out and that's let's be let's be comfortable in the schlock so as <laughs> regular viewers of um role for combat know that we always talk about movies 
So this is a dream come true. I finally get to talk about movies with someone who literally talks about movies. <laughs> I love movies. Yeah, I do too. Uh, no, I haven't but... seen like new movies. Oh no, we're gonna be talking about new yeah. movies. Oh no, oh, no, no. Good. We're going deep. We're going into the crap. <laughs> we're going into like the puppet masters and the basket cases, and we're going oh. into the into the real garbage. Puppet master doesn't get enough love, in my opinion. Like, oh, little claymation puppets co- coming to life and killing people. I love it. <laughs> oh yeah, well yeah, puppet master. All those. Well, I don't know if that stuff. I guess it still exists, but it's just a different world because you would go to Blockbuster and you would look mm. at the pictures and you'd be like, "Wow, what is this Puppet Master?" And then you would rent it, and of course, the stuff sucked, but it still made money because people would go and rent them and buy them just from yeah. cover art. And now you have to go to streaming service, and like, it doesn't matter if one person sees it or ten thousand people or a million people; it doesn't matter. Uh, right. You know, they, it's like the streaming service buys it outright. They don't get paid per stream, so who cares? And I feel like that's being lost. Is that and uh, best of the worst is the only thing keeping uh, you and actually Mystery Science Theater and Joe Bob, and that's it. Mm. Like you got you three <laughs> are the one keeping that that tradition alive. Which there's is a few people out there who are there's still kind others. of, yeah. but, but you know, like. We we're no longer living. We we're not living in a golden era of media. We're not living in a platinum era of media. We are living in a glittering area of media, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So many wonderful little shiny things everywhere. Mm-hmm. There's too much. There there there's far too much media for us to possibly consume, mm-hmm. and there's no longer a zeitgeist there's no longer like the the one thing it's very rare now that there's the one thing oh there's someone at my front door yeah well if you can hear my dog in the background nope. i do apologize you cannot yeah i got canceled so yep. your system is working well nice thanks zoom uh so we no longer have that like zeitgeist it's very very rare that one thing will punch through and really like attach to people mm-hmm. Uh, which is, you know, like that's just part of the world we live in where we have to accept the fact that someone might make a really good movie that no one really watches or talks about. Someone might make <laughs> a, something that gets washed away. And that's the unfortunate side effects. Oh, yeah. In fact, I hate to say it, but because of the Barbieheimer was such, <laughs> and you guys even talked about this little, that was such a game changer. You better believe next year we're going to be seeing them going for everything becoming a Barbieheimer to turn it into an event. And doesn't matter what the movie is. They're going to do everything in their power so that you turn these into events so people will see the movies, whether they're good or bad. Right. You know, well, and you know, like that was that was a perfect storm, and that came about really naturally. The Barbie Heimer is just mm-hmm. like here's two big movies coming out on the same day that are, you know, polar opposites as far as content. And I guess I don't know. Part of me hopes that they do that, like that, because that's fun. Like competition, you know, breeds excitement, mm-hmm. and so there was a little comp- competitive element to it. There was a little like, aren't mm-hmm. movies weird? Element to it, where on the same day we can have, mm-hmm. you know, this four hour uh biopic about you know a, a complicated person doing a complicated thing and we got barbie too we are ah, it's a fun it's a fun time no oh, yeah no it works <laughs> it was very good it was it was and i i don't know like i know a lot of people nowadays are having really bad movie going experiences no I that's will... just you yeah, and Jack, no. you're Jack. Uh, Rich, not Rich. Mark, Mike. That's all Mike does is complain. That seems to, he complains. I think you guys just have been. I don't have any of those problems when I see theaters. No. Ever. And by the way, neither do I. I love movie theaters. I will. I love. I love hearing everybody's reaction. Like being in a theater when the the big thing happens mm-hmm. and the theater goes silent. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a magical, magical time. That energy that can feed, like if you're watching a funny movie and everyone's laughing, it makes it funnier. When everyone's crying, it makes it sadder. The energy that is bounced off uh, when when you are in a theater full of people is mm-hmm. worth every bad experience. I've never had uh, an experience so bad that I've like asked for a refund or anything. But so that's just me. I yeah. The only thing that's bad is when people use their that i don't like when they use their cell phones because then it's like bright and it messes up your eyes other than that (laughs) i've never had a real bad experience and i i've seen 
thousands, you know, hundreds. I used to take theater <laughs> class. I mean, I see everything. Uh, I'm just so surprised. I'm like, yeah. And it seems like I'm never going to see a movie with Mike because every time he sees a movie, it seems like he has bad luck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, that it's like be. all he does is complain. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I, where does he live? I, I will never I will never understand. And I've talked to someone about this. I've talked to someone who who has admitted to me, uh, and this is you know not a, an internet person. This is mm-hmm. just someone I know. Who you who like checks their phone in the middle of a movie? No, oh. and it's just like, but you you paid money. My wife to see does this that, movie. by the way, all the time. Huh? My wife does that all the time. That's insane <laughs> to me. I'm like, stop you have, checking your phone. <laughs> you have you have given money to be here. Why are you not giving your full attention to the thing you just gave money to? It blows my mind how you I'm going to agree with that as someone who has gone on the record on this show of not liking watching things in theaters especially (laughs) as an activity with friends Mm -hmm. because I'd rather be able to talk to them than be in a dark room not talking to them (laughs) if I do go to the theater I'm not going to be on my phone I'm definitely watching it at that point like I've made that commitment yeah yeah so to me that's (laughs) that's insane but I also think, like, as someone who has uh, attention issues, to put it mildly, uh, like, if I'm watching a movie, you know, on my nice TV with my nice surround sound at home, my phone is right there, and it's real easy to check it. But if I'm in a theater and I paid money, I can't pause this. You are getting my full attention. Of course. (laughs) So what are some of your favorite movies? Bad, good, otherwise? Like, what are some of your... So favorite many. bad ones or good ones. favorite bad. <laughs> uh you know like there's there's like bad right fun, well i was gonna say there's, there's bad, bad interesting and then there's re- like there's like i'll give some examples and these ones everyone knows like bad but not really that bad like ice mm-hmm. pirates that's not that bad that's a fun no, movie um you know, like ghoulies, you know, it's one level below. Like that one's like not so great, but it's fun. Um, you know, the trolls are the easy ones, but then you can go really right. low to like the pod people. Like that's, I think that's actually, I think bad like, movie. you know, if there, there are fun, bad movies, you know, there's your samurai cops, there's right. your, the room, right. right. There's your, um, uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the the neil breen movie that broke neil breen oh I not double one. down it was like his second or third i know which one i actually just watched the thing about this yesterday what a magical day what a magical day is um uh, neil breen man neil breen's weird uh, neil breen is beautiful no uh, he's he is not double down wait well he has so many i'm here yeah. now pass through pass twisted through. pair Faithful uh, uh, findings. Pass through is, I believe, the one I'm thinking of. Hold on, I gotta now. I gotta Google it. Well, double downs uh, pan- is first, then I'm here now, then faithful findings, then pass through, then Fa- oh, faithful findings. That's okay, the one. Okay. Faithful so findings. by the way, you want to if you want to, you know, have a beautiful uh, movie uh, experience, go watch Faithful Findings. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is, uh, it's it's a, a remarkably uh, entertaining bad movie. Where that anyone, anyone of any movie going experience can enjoy because it's so bad. It's it's like the epitome of so bad it's good. It's it's a beautiful time. Oh His latest one, the uh, the Cade, uh, Cade's Crossing or whatever. His newest one actually did a theatrical run. Came to Milwaukee. I, I got to take like my my teenage kid to go see uh, see it with me and like the crowd reacting to it, it was a beautiful beautiful experience. Like that's that's the the fun of the so bad it's good there are there are so bad that they're bad movies that i find to be incredibly interesting in how just how every everything was a mistake you know like we uh we did on uh, on the show we did robot in the family which is you know just a movie uh, of absurd level chaos that we i don't even think we did a, a good a, enough job of articulating how bad that movie was uh that or um what was the road trip movie where uh the road trip movie where where the guy oh it doesn't matter it doesn't matter so there there are movies that are so bad that they are fascinating just trying to dissect the meaning from but you know, it, 
also here's a, here's a controversial opinion here's a movie i legitimately enjoy it came out a few years ago uh of roland emmerich's moonfall to me that is the kind of schlock that i really like moonfall a movie about the moon falling uh <laughs> i love so you know what movie i've seen probably 10,000 times that I just watched even a few days ago, which is in that same level. Mm-hmm. The Core. You know, the Core. The yeah, core. Yeah. And, and that's Moonfall. <laughs> but the problem with Moonfall is Moonfall, it's too much. I love I love Emmerich. I love all that stuff. But I feel like, I think The Core is kind of right at the peak where you still got some serious actors. You got like Academy Award winners in this freaking thing. And they're mm-hmm. like Stanley Tucci's in it and was it Hillary Swank? And I'm like, that's a real movie. You know, they're really trying here. And they got like real special effects. And I was like, you know, it was like, this is pretty good. Oh, and Mark, the uh, the kid from uh, the computer genius in the core came, went to Carnegie Mellon. So there you go. Um, there you have it. There you have there it. But <laughs> like, I think that, Jack, you make a really good point about engaging with something that's so bad that it's bad because it's fascinating. Like for me, <laughs> it's not movies, but it's um, like in game design when it comes to a new game like there's a board game and one of my friends or family are like we've got a new board game mark have you heard of this one i'll be like i've heard of it i've never played it they're like great i'll teach it to you and i'm like i want to read the instructions (laughs) and then sometimes they'll say no 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 you don't want to read the instructions these instructions are really bad and confusing and it's hard to learn from the instructions you have to if i tell you it'll be much easier than if you read the instructions or just play it yeah. Then I'll be like, well, now I really want to read the instructions <laughs> because I want to, what went wrong? Right. Why are these instructions so bad? What, what is the issue? Actually... Alicia, you obviously know how to play it now. <laughs> uh, did someone else teach you? Did you learn it by playing? Where were the thing? What were the things that you picked up during the game that the instruction manual, like didn't do a good job of explaining or had in a weird place that you couldn't find them. And then I'm going to read it and see, yeah. Oh yeah, this is, they chose to introduce it in a way that made sense maybe to the game designer, but wasn't like where a new person would be looking for that information and try to figure it out. And it helps me improve because you can learn more from your mistakes Absolutely. than from your successes. And therefore you can learn from somebody else's <laughs> mistakes. Now, you know, it's really important, you, you know, not to wallow in the mistakes because then you just end up not creating anything, but right. you're, you're absolutely right of there. There's an academic side to so bad. It's bad where like it's it's not a thing you can recommend to kind of the general audience of like oh this has no enjoyment value for the general audience but for someone who's so deep into it oh i want to i want to understand why every decision was made in in hopes that i don't you know make those decisions sure <laughs> hmm. what do you think of um here's a weird one the first i'd say good bad movie is rocky horror one of my absolute favorite movies. Well, pretty much. Oh, I will disagree with you that it's a good, bad movie. Is it just a good, good movie? Uh, one, it's just a good, uh, no, like, so B movie. Has it was, it, be- it also was inspired just to interrupt you. It literally yeah. was inspired by 50 B movies. Yes. <laughs> like it, it literally was. Yeah, it's like, well, and I guess like that's the B movie and bad movies to have become conflated. Like mm-hmm. a lot of people will say bad movie when they mean B movie and Rocky Horror Picture Show to me is an example of a perfect B movie. Like they knew what they were making. They knew they were making something camp mm-hmm. and dumb and low budget and they did all they could with it. I I think it is uh, if we look at like the structure of the narrative, if we listen to the songs, which are all bangers uh, and we see the performances, uh, we have good performances, we have a good story structure and we got banger songs. That is a perfectly adequate movie on a very low budget. It's a B movie, classic B movie. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, they had no budget for that. And (laughs) that is. Uh, yeah, by the way, Rocky Heart, I probably have listened to that soundtrack more than anything <laughs> ever. <laughs> I've yeah. any in my life, and I've seen the play a million times. I saw it in the original uh midnight showing in the Greenwich Village. You know, I did all that stuff, and but it is fascinating because that you see, that's like a high class B movie because it's like a B movie <laughs> with a you know less than a million dollars, mm-hmm. but they had 
A plus plus actors before they were A plus plus actors. Like they, you know, right. everyone in that was just. I mean, Meatloaf. Are you kidding me? I mean, he freaking <laughs> defined that movie. You know, like he so was I wanna, so good. I want to go back here for my own edification yes. in movie term history because mm-hmm. you guys are experts on this. Mm-hmm. B movie. The B stands for bad. I thought it stood for B list, and it meant that it was like you would do a double feature, and you'd have the A one, and then that's, the B one would correct. be afterwards, and yes. it was like just but, not on the correct. top list. But yes, I just heard. Uh, I think one of you said that the B it stands for bad um, well, my, when it was come up with, and I my, didn't even realize that was part of the etymology. My my point was it's been conflated. Is you are correct. oh it be, some people mm-hmm. accident. I I yes. get it now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That happens to so many terms where people <laughs> see it and they're like, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to assume it means this. <laughs> there are just words that just don't mean anything anymore. Like the term, especially when people are bad at explaining them, like the term <laughs> proc, P R O C. Right. A probabilistic random occurrence from like EverQuest or whatever. <laughs> and it means that like there's some random chance that something will happen when you like swing your weapon and there's a chance that it lights them on fire. But everybody just said, oh, it's going to proc this. And they didn't tell newbies what that meant. They just used this weird arcane terminology. And then the newbies didn't know. So they started overgeneralizing it. And now online, the term proc to most people just means it means well, not. It just means like do. It in, means almost nothing as a in verb. video game terms now, though, proc does mean something different. Uh, you know, like now proc is synonymous with a process coming to completion, which is like, you know, for example, if uh, we have any Elden Ring players, you know, like building up poison when the poison procs, when the poison process has completed, that's when the enemy is actually poisoned. Yeah. So like the the etym- the the definition has changed slightly throughout video games. Or it, it's yeah. changed to now be meaningless, because it can mean that. <laughs> no. it, it just it basically means do or happen. Well, proc, right, exactly. it, it went from probabilistic random occurrence to just it, it happens. Because you'll be like, right. no, I you're right. my fireball, when the fireball procs, it, uh, all these people take the damage. It just means do or happen. Came from World of Warcraft. So you should know that, Mark. That's where it, did it started. Not. It was well, no, used no, no, no. in EverQuest sorry, no, no, no. before World of Warcraft. Oh, okay, yes, you're right. World of Warcraft. Uh, sorry, EverQuest even before that. So but... it was earlier, and that's what it stood for. And right. trust me, I was the newbie who didn't know what people were talking about. I looked, <laughs> But I looked it up, and I figured out yeah. what it meant. Right. And if I hadn't, maybe I would have also thought it meant do or happen. <laughs> and now, just like, I'll see people being like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna proc um, a sword swing on this, uh, or you know, I'm gonna you know, proc another spell. Well, and it's then just like it just, just, it just can be used for anything yeah. at this point. <laughs> and Jack, you're absolutely right. Procking the poison, meaning that the poison happens. Whereas originally, proc the poison would be like I have a sword, and there's a five percent chance it poisons you on each sure. hit. And sure. so, like all of these terms. And I could see that happening for B movies. It happens all the time, mm-hmm. or like mob. For monster that stood for mobile because some creatures in the early MMOs were immobile, mm-hmm. and then people were like, "Oh, well, they must mean the large groups of monsters that are the mobs." I mean, that actually makes more sense. There are just yeah. so many terms that are abbreviated that now I understand. Thank you for explaining it to me. That I was, I guess, I was right originally, and, and then I got like Correct. let off into the weaves. <laughs> so wait, we have so many now. We have questions. People are people are impressed. We we brought up Clue two days in a row, which is that that of all the it's, movies, that, movie. that's kind of insane. All right, let's see. And then thinking of Rocky Horror, really, we're just, this is turning into a, a Tim Curry love fest, which I'm very okay with. <laughs> Actually, that's true. Oh, I let's see, we'll Curry. talk about Legend next. Or you know, I saw early Legend in the theater, baby. <laughs> oh, beautiful movie. Oh, I saw that in the theater. Uh, which soundtrack is better, Rocky Horror, Grease? And they actually even threw in one more. It's a Little Shop of Horrors. Because when Little Shop of Horrors came out, everyone thought that would become the new Rocky Horror, but it didn't. Um, Mm -hmm. Rocky Horrors. I mean, Grease is good. Little Shop of Horrors is great. But Rocky Horror, I don't think there's a bad track on Rocky Horror. Like, they are... even Even the, quote, worst track is still fantastic. Like, every song in Rocky Horror is amazing. Then why did you say it was good, bad, if it's fantastic? That just sounds like good, good. Because at the time, it was it was, a, it was a very, 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 very low-budget movie. 
mm-hmm. that had all these future stars in it. Like everyone in it. <laughs> I Tim Curry, that might have been his like first or second movie ever. Oh, well, Tim Curry, Susan Sarandon, yeah, Barry Susan, Bostwick. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um and well, what's his Pete name? Loaf. Uh, uh Riff the, Raff, lo- the uh, Loaf was in it. Uh, Pete, yeah, right. You Meatloaf <laughs> and you had uh um uh, what's his name? Um uh, the the guy who wrote it, uh, t- uh, the guy who wrote started it, Riff Raft. What's his name in real life? Uh, well, I have no idea. Okay, I don't remember names or places or people. Oh, you just li- listed all the people. You just listed. That's Riff true. Raft. Well, those are the big names. Okay, those well, are the big names. Are you kidding, Riff Raft? So, how about this? Did you know? Speaking of good bad movies, there was a sequel to Rocky Horror. <gasps> Did you know that? Ah, uh, deep down in the recesses of my brain, I might have known that. I don't know what it's called. It is called. Uh, it is so, so, so bad. Oh, uh, Richard O'Brien, that's the guy. He wrote uh, Riff Raff. He wrote uh, Rocky Horror, who plays Riff Raff. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. it was called Shock Treatment, and it is. Uh-huh. It's just bad. <laughs> it's not even good. It's just. <laughs> it's just bad. Bad. It's not good. Bad. It's just bad. <laughs> which is sure. kind, of, kind of a shame sure, sure. uh okay moonfall we got to go back to that why do you like moonfall i love his movies i can well i disagree with rich i know he hates independence day independence day is a damn masterpiece of cinema 100% independence day is a masterpiece oh, masterpiece uh, yeah absolute yeah, masterpiece huh? in many ways like i can go into it forever i'm talking yeah. story structure character structure uh, oh. everything it, it's an am- the, amazing movie <laughs> the people people look down uh in general uh, film film people look down on roland emmerich because he is a simple filmmaker mm. uh, but uh, to me that's what makes him so special is he does the work and the way that work is done might be a little simplistic like characters will introduce themselves like their character trait and their relationship to whomever they're talking to within their first couple of lines which i think is like screenwriting 101 uh which by the way i'm also okay with because as an audience member i know who that is i know what their character traits are and i know what their relationship is Mm -hmm. to the other person so i love it and moonfall to me is is that glorious schlock like Mm -hmm the the moon's fallen and now we have weird gravity situations we got space we got conspiracy theories we got people fighting against the moon is it dumb 100 percent. is it a lot of fun 110 percent. so you have you seen then what's that the spaceship earth uh the korean movie where... Oh, I don't think I have seen Spaceship Earth. Now I gotta oh, oh. do I gotta add that to my list? Oh my god, you never oh I think I oh my god, I have a movie of you. I I can die a happy person. There's a lot of, there's a lot of movies out there. Yeah, that's true. Well, no, this is We're uh, in the glittery oh, wait, age. No, that's there's space too many. Earth. Thank Sorry, you, it's, Mark. Not, it's true. It's not sh- spaceship earth. Uh what's the one where they turn Earth into uh, a spaceship? It's a Korean movie, if anyone out there knows. It's called um uh wandering earth that was it wandering earth sorry you, you, someone yeah, else got a freelancer you. had it in chat yeah wandering earth, the... wandering earth uh and there's a sequel uh, basically it's a chinese science fiction movie oh, on nice. netflix it's one of the highest grossing movies like ever and it is you guys should definitely see this yes yeah, so here we go made are you ready you've never yeah. heard of this movie 700 million dollars it made that's great. <laughs> it's, it's, it That's it shows great. you just how big this world is now. It's like right? it, it, back in the day, it's seven hundred. Everyone heard of a seven hundred million dollar movie. You know, it was like seven hundred million dollar. I've never even heard of this movie, and it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's because, but it's about watering Earth, where basically the Earth is going to like get destroyed. Um, it's the fifth highest grossing movie of all time in China. Uh, Beautiful. It, and there's a there's a sequel, and they're making a pre- prequel. Uh, oh, there's a certain sequel. Is the prequel, and it is basically that the uh, the sun is going to engulf Earth, and so they're like, "Fine, let's just uh, put engines on the Earth and move it out of the." <laughs> I was like, "This Hell is right yeah. up there." Schlock, that that's schlock uh, beauty right there. I the, love it. Uh, yeah. Can we? There you go, Stephen. If you talk enough about Chinese companies and things, they may scrape your video again with with I AIs so. like that other time. I know. I hope so. I, no, I think. Hope it. I think like you know, having fun. Having fun is important, and it's like, you know, we can have 
as as much the the thing is as much as i love oppenheimer i generally speaking don't care for like christopher nolan films because christopher nolan is someone who really likes to connect all of the dots you know he's a filmmaker who is, is very um particular oh if this like extraordinary thing happens it happens because of this and this and this and you see there's a there's an explanation why this extraordinary thing happened and sometimes i just want the extraordinary thing to happen and us to have a lot of fun while we watch it we don't need all the little dots all the time uh (laughs) and i think like so you there's a lot of moviegoers no who yeah. disagree with that, and I'm okay with that as well. You're, you're like, I, I, I want movies that just make no sense whatsoever, and that's uh, that's it. Sounds good. Yeah, a, a little bit of sense is great. Too much sense is too much. Like I don't, I don't need to uh, fully understand. Uh, let's see if I can think of an example. Like I don't need to fully understand the logical reason. Why a cat woman wears high heels is so she can better ride her motorcycle. I we don't need that. <laughs> you know? Guess my I don't need now. to understand exactly why. Uh trying to think of more Nolan shenanigans. But you know, I, I think there's there can be a world in which too much explaining. Uh uh for example, uh, and this isn't Nolan, I I forget who did this. Uh who, whomever whomever's idea it was to make the S on Superman stand for hope. I don't know if that was done in the comics. I don't know if that was done in the movies. I don't care. I think it's stupid. He has an S on his chest because he's Superman. <laughs> oh, actually. Uh, the crest of the house of the It's L the crest. That's like right. That. I was about to say, that's actually the crest of his house. Right. And, you, and you know <laughs> what? And it stands for hope and it's bullshit. Well, it's no, it doesn't stand for hope. He's... That's not stand for Doesn't hope. it? Well, no, they say that, but that's yeah. not true. In fact, in Superman 1, the original <laughs> Christopher Reeves, you could see them all walking around the planet with yeah. their with their with their symbols on their chest of their houses, and you and by see the way, that. I think that's stupid. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I think it's I like think... A, it's just a name tag. It's a big name it's... tag on their chest. <laughs> He's got an S because he's Superman. We don't need any more information. We don't need to explain why he's got that. That to me is stupid. So maybe the S stands for stupid. (laughs) Maybe the S stands for he's goddamn Superman. So he wears an S on his chest. Uh, have you ever (laughs) seen Batman wears a bat on his chest? Right. Exactly. Um, Sometimes. Yeah, well, and, and also that's been like you know in several of his movies that has been like a utility, and it's like come on, just it's a bad because he's Batman, just fucking fucking fuck fuck. So you didn't <laughs> like the scene in Superman two where he rips the ass off and like envelops uh... <laughs> that's <laughs> the bad. Right. That's like that's infamous of how bad that scene. I'm like they're like what? What's it just had? Did he just rip the ass off? And it There's developed... a lot. There's a lot in <laughs> Superman two that that makes you go hmm. <laughs> it's a great movie and a bad movie. Now I'll say the best from you now if you want to talk about if you want to watch a bad movie and learn from it, I will give you the number one best movie, in my opinion. Okay. Xenogenesis by James Cameron. Have you ever seen Xenogenesis? So Xenogenesis is the first movie James Cameron ever made for twenty thousand dollars in nineteen seventy eight. And everything in the movie, he then used in Terminator and Aliens. <laughs> like the design of the hunter killers yeah. were from Xenogenesis. And like all these ideas. So that was like, what's fascinating is you watch this because you think, oh, yeah, it just came from Alien. It's like, no, it all came from Cameron's mind. And if you watch this movie back when he was like a kid, you know, he had this, which is really interesting. It's like he had these ideas when he was a kid. Mm-hmm. made a student film, eventually did Corman films, which got him uh, Terminator, and then he reused the Hunter Killers from Xenogenesis in Terminator, and it's like he literally used everything he learned from that. And then if you watch some of the early Cameron films, because he pretty much directed... Uh, oh, wait, which movie was it that he pretty much directed? Is uh, one of the... Cam- uh, what is it? Um... No, it was it was before Piranha Two. It was the one before that with the giant sp- space slug that like rapes a woman. That he had to build this huge space slug, and he used the same 
mechanism to build the queen alien so like oh. everything he learned from all these movies so if you watch his early movies yeah, yeah. You, it's one of those like yeah i mean i know you um i know uh uh what's his name loves halo uh your boss uh second win uh nick nick loves halo <laughs> well if you want if you play marathon by bungie Hey, to break it, that's Halo. You know, like everything in Marathon <laughs> came from, you know, everything in Halo came from Marathon. And everything yeah. from Marathon even came from, oh, what was it? Uh, Beneath the Darkness. I forgot the game they did where you were in the inverted pyramid. That, that oh, was sure. the first I, I, game. Like, I think Cameron is a is a fantastic filmmaker. Like, you know, I don't always like his movies. I haven't seen all of his movies, but I think he's, in general, he's a fantastic no, filmmaker. He, yeah, he's, yeah. He, he's incredible. Mm -hmm. But do watch that because of, I like to see that because I've, I what's what's fascinating is I do like to see the genesis of these ideas and yeah. where you see like wow this and you don't see that anymore because you can watch a lot of 80s movies and see oh these guys worked on this movie and then when they did their big you know as as like a B you know as like the the B director or second yeah. unit guy and then you see them in the, their mainstream movie and you're like okay they literally took it. They stole from themselves. They literally well, stole from themselves. But now we're just seeing like uh, filmmakers' old YouTube videos. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> right? No, Which is just true. as fun. Yeah, that's, I didn't think about that. But Which it's... is just as fun. But like, I, I agree with you. Like, going back to like, going back to like an El Mariachi to see, you know, like what, oh, what yeah. was Robert Rodriguez doing before he had a budget or like, you know, the first The Evil Dead, which, you oh. know, is. By by no means a good movie, but that's a good movie. <laughs> that's it's gonna be that's heresy. But Evil Dead Two, you know, obviously one of no. the, the most perfect movies ever, ever. made. The yeah. the Evil Dead. Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> Evil Dead's very rough, and Evil Dead Two is literally let's remake the <laughs> Evil Dead with more money. Yes, exactly. that's all it is. <laughs> Which I'm okay, but to me that that kind of stuff is always fascinating to me. Like, you know, you can the like looking back and seeing like, oh, my God, this person has something incredibly special. Um, you know, one of one of my favorite movies, one of the most important movies ever to me is Clerks. Uh, I, I, you know, I stand by that 100 percent. I think Kevin oh, Smith yeah. is one of the most influential directors of our modern time. Um, but like, you know, that was his first big movie out. And it's like, oh, it was so unique and you know genre defying uh did you that... see uh I, I saw clerks i actually saw i i went out of my way to find it and saw it in the theater mm -hmm. i saw clerks 2 in the theater mm -hmm. and i did see clerks 3 what do you think of clerks 3 because clerks 3 is a fascinating movie because it's a deconstruction of his first movie did you see clerks 3 here, here's the thing. So Clerks is is probably one of the most important movies to me personally. Clerks mm -hmm. 2, I think, is a, a phenomenal, uh, is a, one, a phenomenal movie and a phenomenal example of Kevin Smith as a storyteller is, mm -hmm. you know, like using his life as an allegory uh, in, in the movie, like where mm -hmm. he is as a filmmaker versus where the clerks are. Um, uh, uh, Anon Adderman is just getting to the point. Yes, Evil Dead 2 is a masterpiece. Evil Dead 1, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, as soon as uh, but so I haven't seen any Kevin Smith post Clerks two. Oh, you didn't um, see Clerks three? No, because I know what the premise is, and the premise of Clerks three invalidates all of the story of Clerks two. So I don't want to watch it because I love Clerks two. Interesting. Well, yeah, you're right. He does do that. But I would say <laughs> I was I'm in the same boat because I felt. Ugh, he's using his heart attack as a cop out, mm -hmm. but it's done so well, and he really loves the source material and his dead wife. She's in it. She's in the movie quite a bit, uh, by the way. So it's not like she's totally gone. I do feel that was a bit of a cop out, but I understand why he did it because otherwise, no. why would uh, Randall still be in uh, New Jersey? Because otherwise, the... he'd be in Florida. You know, the 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 idea with Clerks, too, is, you know, the the convenience store is an allegory for, like, Kevin Smith's comfort filmmaking, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, he wanted, he was trying to do these corporate things, he was trying to branch out, and, at, you know, at the end of the day in Clerks 2, spoiler alert for Clerks 2, is they, you know, the clerks buy the convenience store uh, and just decide to do what they want to do, which mm -hmm. is be in Clerks. And his career after that was literally Kevin Smith doing 
whatever he wanted to do. He was directing CW superhero shows. He was making yeah. yoga hosers. Why? Because he could. <laughs> like he was, he was literally living his best life. Mm -hmm. And so to go back to that well of like, well, actually, maybe the convenience store wasn't what we wanted to do. Is like, fuck it, I'm I'm out. <laughs> it's interesting. It's 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 extremely autobi uh, autobiographical. Yes. So I would I would. I'd watch it. It's better than you think. Because I also, I didn't see it in the theater because I was sort of like, ugh. I'm like, I was excited until I heard the story and then I yeah. saw it and I was like, actually, it's not bad. It's 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 fascinating. I don't know if it's a good movie. I don't know if it's a bad movie, but it's definitely a fascinating movie. Uh, <laughs> and that's possible. That's possible. Yeah. I don't know. Like, Kevin Smith is is such an important filmmaker to me that I want to, tr I'm, I'm trying to uh leave his legacy on a high note with me i don't <laughs> i don't want to be fair disappointed enough. uh so, <laughs> fair so i looked up this superman thing everyone was right uh including <laughs> when jack said that it was hope and by by this i mean the original comic explanation is clark made it himself and was like it stands for superman and saving lives and the other oh, okay. people start with s and it was just a very corny explanation yeah. with s mm -hmm. then and the 1978 movie or whichever one it was, yes, it was like, this is correct. the symbol of the House of L. Right. Yeah. Oh. Now, there were multiple other ones during certain TV series where it was like, well, Martha made it um, or uh, maybe Jonathan Kent made it because he had a psychic connection to a giant Kryptonian sword that, that told him to do it. As you, and, as one would. Perfectly uh, read. Although <laughs> where it was just like kind of, Either Alexander the Great symbol, according to Lex Luthor, but also like Jor-El, like laser eyed it into the flesh of Clark, so it was clearly connected to something else, and they left it mysterious. Yeah. And in 2004 film, it had what Jack said, where they said it was not just the the symbol of the House of Al, but it was also the Kryptonian symbol for hope. And there are some that just like did multiple of the explanations where it was like, well, Martha mostly made it, but then Clark was like, well, add the S, I think. And so like there's <laughs> there's about like 10 permutations that use yeah. somewhere around three different major themes for it that have been done throughout the Comic years. Books. You're welcome. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, man, I can do this all day. Tell me a little bit about Palenko. Palinko P Pachinko. What do you guys call it? What's First this? of all, yeah, you got to know what it's called if you're going to add Plinketto. 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 Obviously, Plinketto. You know, ba based off of uh, the famous Price Plinko. is Right game. Yeah. Plink, uh, Plinko. Uh, you Plinketto. Know, uh, Plinketto. <laughs> built by Rich Evans. Uh, you know, like it's, it's a way to spice up the show, you know, add a little drama here and there. Uh, we went through several iterations of what to drop because, you know, Rich did a very good job making that board, but like, you know, it's just wood. It, it's just painted wood. I think like in the Price is Right, it's probably plexiglass, something mm -hmm. a little smoother. Maybe they powder it. We don't know because uh, we don't have anything uh, to do with the Price is Right. And so like it, it's been a kind of a, a trial by errors <laughs> is like, oh, we're going to try this. This one doesn't work. Uh, the the ball uh, seems to work very well, is very random. Mm -hmm. I want to say there's a fan out there that has calculated in what spot the ball has dropped on for every uh, ball. And there's like two of them that are statistically or that have in the past been most statistically probable, even though it is random. It's as random as we can get it. But mm -hmm. so you say how random is so I do wonder because you guys are like, oh, we're going to spin the wheel of the worst and choose yeah. what we want. But then so Mike sometimes moves it. He's like, oh, you know, and then sometimes I know you guys watch the show, a movie that's so bad that you're like, screw this, throw it out. We're not even going to bother. I mean, is it like random or is it just like you all have a, it sounds like you all have a, a agreement that yes, we'll watch it. But if a, it's so boring that we literally can't make a show out of it, that we yeah. throw it away and just do a different one. I mean, at the end of the day, we're we are trying to make an entertainment show. Right, so if right. we don't feel like the show is going to be entertaining, we will, you know, pick something new. Okay. Uh, what I will say is, anytime we pick something new, or you know, someone fudges it, you see that on camera. If okay. if it's not shown on camera, it is one hundred percent random. We had um. I can tell you how I know it's random is because we had uh, the the lovely and talented and funny Pat Oswald uh, came to Milwaukee, spent an entire day with us against 
his better judgment and all of us telling him he should not. Um, and uh, we tried to stack the Plinketto board as much as we can. We're going to put all like things that are should be all killer. Uh, but we don't watch the movies beforehand. Uh, a lot of these are known by reputation. Mm -hmm. A lot of these are maybe like uh, distribution companies that we know have put out garbage uh, stuff we hear about through the grapevine. Uh, we do try to film our genuine reaction to the movies. And so like that episode, we had three absolute stinkers. <laughs> uh, so even with a special celebrity guest, the randomness chose three super stinkers, which is how you know it's really random. <laughs> I need to know because he goes off on that episode and I'm like, either he's the greatest actor ever or he's really mad. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it was a, a mix between the both. Like okay. something to understand is we watch in their entirety, three movies and then have a discussion. That's maybe two or three hours long. It is a time commitment <laughs> uh, that he was warned about before he got there. Um, but and so like if you get even even if you get one movie that is amazing like if you have two stinkers and then robot in the family mm -hmm. the comedy is easy you're just setting up clips at that mm -hmm. point like look at this bizarre thing look at this bizarre thing the, but if you have movies that maybe don't have a lot to talk about you don't have a lot of clips to set up then you are really working hard to come up with bits to come up with things to talk about and so i think Patton was expecting kind of an easy shoot day and he had a he had a tough shoot day <laughs> that's his own damn fault and, so why and, you know yeah, why, it's fun. why don't they let you drop the 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 play plinketto whatever you're going to call the the ball the disc the thing why do they why do they hate you why do they hate you jack yeah no they hate me for so many reasons one because i'm so handsome two because i'm so funny uh, so... <laughs> that explains a lot no they that never let you drop it right you know, it's before the fall the uh, you know uh, here's the, here's the truth of the matter is we don't plan out the show before we film it oh you couldn't tell and so <laughs> Um, the other thing is like, I, uh, Mike J and I are all filmmakers. Like we all got our start making videos, rich, not really a filmmaker. And so like, usually I'm behind the camera. So then I'm not mm -hmm. the one dropping the ball. If, if one of them is on camera, I'm behind the camera. Um, and so it just worked out that way. And then it was a funny joke. I was like, okay, yeah, Jack, Jack hasn't dropped the ball. Great. There you go. <laughs> But now that's the gag, and I'm okay with that. You're okay? Oh, man. I just thought you were scared of heights. <laughs> it's pretty high I'm, up. <laughs> it's one, it's very high up. Two, uh, Red Letter Media does not provide me with insurance. Oh. Uh, so, <laughs> so they would drop me off, like, on the curb. <laughs> They're like, yeah, we don't know what happened to him. We found him on the street. <laughs> here, here you go. Oh, like, weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some hobo uh, fell down somewhere, I guess. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh no it's all it's all good fun we just yeah. so I'm, what, what I'm is uh players. red letter media's obsession with dutch angles i don't think there's a single episode that goes by without dutch angles being mentioned <laughs> every every single time <laughs> uh, it's not our obsession uh bad filmmakers are obsessed with dutch angles I, again uh, you know we talked about this a little bit with emmerich is a lot of times uh, especially for bad bad movies, you will see kind of like a person's first movie right out of film school. Mm. And so they are really eager to show off their education, which, you know, means complicated camera maneuvers, uh, cinematography, that sort of stuff. And a lot of times that kind of bullshit is pointless. <laughs> like we don't need it all. <laughs> Got it. So... so it's an easy thing to pick on. Huh? Okay. No, no, actually, no, that does make sense. Because I'm always amazed. I was like, I was half joking, half being real, because it's like, it always comes up. And I'm like, now that makes sense. It's like, oh, these early filmmakers like to use these tricks yeah. that more sophisticated, you know, filmmakers, it's, especially when they you know, like a, a, Another thing we will too. always harp on, like, especially with low-budget filmmakers, is when they are so proud of their dolly. And oh. any <laughs> anyone who has been a no budget filmmaker, I was for a long, long time. I, you know, like I, I got my start making kind of sketch uh, comedy videos with Funny or Die, and you mm -hmm. have no budget. You're just making sketches, and so everyone I know 
who was a no budget filmmaker built their own PVC uh, office chair dolly system, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, and when a low budget filmmaker, when they have nothing but dolly shots for five straight minutes, you go, oh, they were so proud of that damn dolly. <laughs> well, now it's uh, now it's not even dolly shots. Now it's all um, uh, drone shots. Now it's drone shots. Yes, you will. And like there was that wave of like in every Netflix show, like they needed a drone, you know, drone shot. Mm-hmm. He's like, drones are so fucking inexpensive nowadays. This is not impressive anymore. Well, that's the thing, it, right? Because it's so cheap. Like yeah. there's so many, and everything has drone shots. Everything. Yes. Every, every reality show, everything on TV, every movie. It's like, all right, and, you know, it. <laughs> it, if it was just like a setup shot and then we cut to a normal, like no one would bother. But like, you know, like when the drone shot lasts for more than two minutes, you're like, oh, they were they were really proud of this drone. <laughs> yeah, but this isn't like um, uh, like City of Men, you know, like where it's like, OK, you have a shot. Uh, you know, wait, wait, is that the one I'm talking about? The one where it's in the in the car um children of children men. of men children of men right it's like now that's impressive i'm like okay even i'm like how the heck did they do that oh, <laughs> you know? right, like, right children of men has made like that's that's a pro that's cinematography that's incredible. yes like, but it's like you know now it's drone shots before it was dollies like uh kind of when everyone was getting their first uh cracked copy of final cut it was uh mm-hmm. gun flares muzzle oh, flashes yeah, yeah, yeah. like you know there there's those those effects that like someone figures out how to do them really easily. And then it's everywhere, Hmm. you know, right now it's, it's kind of like uh, the extreme phone uh, motions for like TikTok uh, restaurant videos. (laughs) If you note it, like if you watch like uh, Instagram videos, it's Mm -hmm. all the phone is. Oh, really? Is that what that's called? (laughs) I don't know what it is, but you know, it's, that that kind of stuff is never going away. The trends of filmmaking. So, are you guys going to be stuck though, just using VHS tapes forever? Because, I mean, I guess you do some best of the worst where you see crap on the streaming services and just like mm-hmm. talk about them. Like, didn't you do like you did like all the Amityvilles or the Uju boards or Oju, whatever they're called? Like, you guys. I want to say. Like it that was something that they did about like all of the yeah like the 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 two B Amityville two B right right like oh even okay let's it, if we even limited ourselves to the VHSs that are currently in the studio we mm-hmm. would never run out of material oh that's good that's good to hear um, I imagine you must guys get a so hundred people just send you buckets of VHS tapes so many <laughs> oh really oh, yeah. oh my it's ridiculous the like the create and you know like uh, we've gotten a lot of really phenomenally good bad movies that way but a lot of times people will send us like normal movies yeah <laughs> like i'm trying to think of a weird example where it's like they'll send us like a uh like babe pig in the city babe Two, pig in the sure. city to be like check out this movie it's like that's just a normal movie like that's not a so bad it's good movie. Well, there was um there's that guy on the internet who collects speed VHS that's tapes. Right. Have you seen that? <laughs> and he's got hundred thousands. <laughs> that's like all he does. And then that speed. was people sent yeah. it to him. And I'm like, but you guys had that with Nuki, because everyone would send you Nuki. <laughs> Do you still Nuki. get Nuki? I, I don't know. I'm not <laughs> You're not the Nuki guy. You're not, I'm not in charge the of Nuki guy anymore. <laughs> uh, anymore? Uh, that means you were at one point. No. I actually I've still never seen Nuki. So, <gasps> it looked I terrible. They showed it. I wasn't they, there that day. Oh, you weren't oh it looked no, so, it looked it looked so bad. Yeah, it could be. It, it didn't look good bad, it just looked bad bad. It wasn't like that, like Mac not. and me bad, which is <laughs> oof. Classically. Oh my classically God. bad. I know, and so it's like, and like the thing we we keep learning over and over again is whether your movie came out on VHS, whether it came out on a DVD pack of twenty movies, or whether it's coming out on a streaming service, or whether you upload it to YouTube, people will still be so egomaniacal that they will think that their movie is really good when it is absolutely not. Mm. Uh, never we will never ever run out of movies because there will always be someone who believes that their farts don't stink so how do you know when they actually do (laughs) now you made me very self-conscious as someone who literally makes games for a living and like makes 
role playing games. Mark, do we stink at our job? Or are we actually <laughs> pretenders? Or are we good? I mean, there's a whole lot of imposter syndrome in pretty much any industry that has to do with creative Absolutely. work. But I think that it's very easy to tell because these movies that like bomb not in like the original british slang where the bomb is a success but that like t like tank that they do really badly mm -hmm. are very obvious when that happens whereas when you have a product that in the scope of tabletop rpgs is very successful then you know that it's pretty unlikely especially when you have returning customers who are like, this is great, we like this, you're putting out a quality product, or when people say, what are the most um, like high quality or reliable third party products that I could get for Pathfinder 2? And then you don't go on there and be like, I'm Steven Glicker and I say it's me, but instead someone else is just like, <laughs> it's, I mean, there's got to be, you know, Battle Zoo from Roll for Combat or maybe one of these one or two other like, options. The, the very fact that you asked that question means that it doesn't apply to you because mm. uh, of, of someone who puts out this kind of material, whether it be in games or music or, mm -hmm. or books or or movies, I, be I truly believe that they never stop to ask themselves like, Am I do? Am I? Is this good? They know it's good before they've ever made it, and that's part of the problem. <laughs> oh. See, if anything, so the, we always look at it and we're like, okay, we got to make it better every time. Right. And as good as yep. it is, we always want to make it even better. We're perfectionists. Yeah. We always want to get everything right. We want to change it. We want to stuff in more content than we even told people we were going to do. Like that's <laughs> pretty classic role for combat. Um, yeah. We do too much. Issue? We do too, <laughs> we do too much. We, oh, our stuff is just too good. Oh, no. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I mean, you've seen it. It you has a lot it. of things <laughs> in there. It's, no, it's, it is like your books have been some of the most fun just to flip through. Just like, da, 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 da. oh, all right. Here's something fun. Like, no, they, they are jam-packed, but like quality control and like it's 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 really weird. Like, Mark, you mentioned kind of like imposter syndrome versus this idea of like, not knowing that I'm putting out garbage. Those are the mm. those are the two sides of the coin. Hmm. And it can feel a lot like the same thing from an outsider's point of view. But because hopefully we have uh, an internal critic, uh, and a lot of times people in the artistic uh, fields are harsher on themselves, is like we have already told ourselves we suck so much that finally when we are willing to put something out, hopefully, it is good enough instead of someone who believes that they are good from the start. Like, oh, this is my first try making a movie. It's going to be a super hit. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. And another piece of evidence you can use is when you have someone who does a lot, like in movies, like a, a film critic who looks at a lot of movies and they like it. So, for example, yesterday we got like just like out of the blue a um what do you call them now? Just a post now that it's X and not a tweet um, wow. by like Owen Casey Stevens, who has done so much in tabletop RPGs just mm -hmm. over the years. Who was like the dungeon ancestry that Mark Seifter designed for role for combat is one of the top 10 creative ideas in tabletop role playing games that you should be looking at. Right. Oh, like, yeah, you're probably not going to have that happen if you are the equivalent of those uh horrible video game movies that were being made um as a tax write-off back in you know the ones like the Uwe Boll or whatever movies if you're that <laughs> you're not going to get that kind of response so I think that you just kind of look to see what other people are saying and that can help your imposter syndrome if your internal critic is too harsh and it hopefully it can help your <laughs> Yeah. Emperor in new clothes syndrome or whatever it is. If your internal critic is just like, you're the best man. Everything you do is gold. Okay. You know, there must be something in the feedback. air. Cause I yeah. just got a notice from chiller theater saying guest announcement coming soon. Never appeared at a convention before. That's your only clue with the font of clue. And then the background of the house I'm like, what is going on? Clue has come up three Blue times is in, in two the days. air. It must That's be. Great. 
That's really like, weird. Well, there is, is this the, a convention that would have actors? Is it like an uh, actor chiller, from a cool movie? Yeah, chiller conventions. Uh, chiller Theater runs basically horror conventions. Mm. Uh, they they do. If you look at they have they have, they have like Sh- Sh- uh, uh, William Chatner is going to be in a convention. You have it's the Warriors are going to be in a convention. It's B sure. type people, <laughs> but but uh, Butch Patrick is going to be at a convention. Um, you know, people Char- in chat think that like Charo's something on your be computer is listening and is auto populating your ads based on oh, totally. what you're saying. Yeah, Dylan McDermott. How did Dylan McDermott? He's like kind of a real person. Rosanna, Rosanna He's a Arquette. Real person. Yeah, wow, look at this. Dylan real McDermott's people. a real person. Dabney Coleman is going to be at this. Holy moly. Dylan McDermott was in uh, one of my favorite Christmas movies, the remake of Miracle on 84th Street. Really? I yes. love that movie. Really? Right? That's Dylan McDermott and uh, and the little girl from Matilda. Yeah, yeah. And... I know which one. Yeah, I never saw it. I know. Oh, it. my God. Schmaltz. Like, we talked a lot about schlock and how, like, we it's okay just to jump right to the action. Schmaltz is un unironically uh, uh, saccharine and and heartwarming and wholesome. Oh, I love oh. Schmaltz so well, much. Well, actually, my favorite Schmaltz movie, which is a caper, by the way, Mark. Uh, <laughs> a but, caper. Uh, is uh, Ocean's 13. Not Ocean's 11, not Ocean's 12. Ocean 13. I don't think you need to tell me that Ocean's anything is a caper, Steven. That's true. <laughs> well, I have this theory. What do you think it's... of this? Are you ready? Okay. Every movie is a caper. Every movie. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, Because there's always, they're always trying to get something. They're always trying to like go somewhere, do something, like get some MacGuffin. So it's, they're all capers. Everything. Every, every movie I can think of has a caper element to it. And it could be something esoteric. It could be like trying to win a girl's harp. Well, that's heart. That's a caper. It's like it's it's there's always a caper in every movie. This is some semantical bullshit, but I'm here <laughs> for it. I'm here. Yeah, for Steven it. always <laughs> tries to make this claim that everything's a heist. Everything's no, a heist. Caper, everything's but... a heist. Everything's caper, a heist. heist. Same thing. Same thing. I, I'm I'm uh, working my hardest to prove you wrong. Oh. <laughs> I'm I'm, go- I'm going it's through hard. The, it's hard. I'm going through the back catalog. <laughs> it's what hard. What do we think? It's it's hard. Every movie is ice. Now, of course, Every movie is ice. absolute garbage movies that have no like connection to them. That like, uh, what's that one with the rock and everyone in it? Uh, what's it? That canter? What, and that tales movie that was atrocious. I forgot that one. Uh, that is like no story structure. I don't count those, but. Um, sure. Yeah, but like um, I forgot the name of that movie, Hollywood Tales, or whatever it was. It was total garbage. But every movie is a heist. Every every movie is a heist because every movie that someone is trying to get something. I think I think though, like that that might just be too vague to be true. But I'm I'm trying but... to think of it. I'm trying to think of an example of a movie in which they're not necessarily trying to achieve anything. Right, exactly. <laughs> Every movie's a heist. So like, I'm trying to see if my <laughs> assertion that every movie with the word oceans in it is definitely a heist. Oh, and South I've Land. not found a counter example. Southland yeah. Tales, that's the movie. That ocean movie on its own, obviously there are things movie. of like the ocean, but yeah. oceans with either apostrophe or no apostrophe S are all heists for sure. The Big Lebowski, there's a freaking heist in that. What do you think? That is literally what the definition of that movie is. (laughs) I was going to say, that that movie contains, I want to say, at least three actual heists. (laughs) So Big Lebowski. I was like, that literally movie is nothing but heists. And um, I would I would say the Cohen brothers literally make nothing but heist movies. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> they're very good at making heist movies. Yeah, that's like their whole thing. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, what about what about a movie? Not documentaries, which, by the way. Those not right. documentaries, of course. Not documentaries. Maybe even not biopics, because that's nope, a, that's its same own thing. genre. Yep, same thing. But I'm talking about drama. Yeah, I'm talking about non. Uh, what about Evil drama. Dead Two? Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2 is about Ash attempting to survive the night, essentially, and not not necessarily attempting to gain anything either physical or metaphysical. Um, you so might is you Evil might... Dead 2 a heist? Is Evil Dead 2 a heist? I've not seen it in about 
10, 15 years. I've been saying a long time. <laughs> I don't remember all the nuances. Obviously, well, they find the book, and then the book does nothing but torture them. I mean, right. and they're not really trying to do anything other than survive. So and, and so, like like you stuff right. like your torture porn movies, your Saw. Like they're trying to escape. And they're trying Maybe to escape. Maybe that's a heist. Maybe. Well, someone actually did say a good one. Boyhood. I oh. actually Boyhood's definitely not really a heist either. That's also not really a movie. That's Let's also not really a movie. I I, I would almost yeah. call that a documentary. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that is a documentary. That movie. I like right. that movie. I saw it. It's a documentary. That's <laughs> a, that is a shtick and not a movie. Yeah, that is shtick. That is. Yeah. Hey, let's just film over eight or ten years and see what we get and put it together. And hey, it's a movie. It's like, but is it? No, is it no, really a, a movie? <laughs> it took twelve years to make. You know what? I know a lot of movies that took 12 years to make, okay? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of movies out there that took a long time to make. Yeah. That doesn't make them good movies or so, movies. So, yeah, my, my counterexample is one we've brought up, Evil Dead 2, which we all agree is a yeah. masterpiece. Yeah, that, you might be right. You know what? You might be right is that pure <laughs> horror movies... And I can see that because the pure horror movies, even if even if you want to go now to the Friday the Thirteenth movies, sure, are not really heists because they're just trying to survive. Even the Freddy Krueger movies, maybe that is the hole in my in my reasoning. Maybe that, horror movies, like but like your yeah. Freddy Krueger, there is a heist element because uh, remember he's trying to steal their souls. Yes. Well, and the, the our heroes like have to like enter the dream realm to yes. you know like kill. kill so like there is a heist element okay, there. There's a yeah, heist yeah. element. Deadpool yeah. two. Deadpool two has features heist. a heist. Yeah, there's like uh, Deadpool two. There's literally a heist where they're stealing. <laughs> <laughs> they're stealing prisoners. They're breaking right. out of prison. <laughs> there's a whole heist montage. That's really great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hunger Games is not a heist. Yes, Hunger Games is a heist. Hunger Games are trying to steal. Um, uh, what's her name? Katniss Everdeen, and get her out of there alive. There, there, it's a coordinated heist against her mm. will and her knowledge. That is, that's that's borderline. Well, oh, sorry, that's like, the sequel. That's the sequel. Is the that's heist. the sequel? Sorry, the and, and so heist. like where it's like you know, and and th this is where we get into your gray area of everything's a heist. Where it's like, is uh, attempting to maintain my life a thing I am achieving, er therefore a heist? So yeah, yeah, I could see that. No, if people are now people coming out of the woodwork. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, take, take them down. Stevens talking schmack and oh, semantics. Yeah, yeah, but think think of it this way: look how hard it is to find movies that don't <laughs> do this. <laughs> it's not easy. I um, mean, conflict. We we like conflict, and uh, you know what? I think what we're learning here is conflicts can come in in a couple different flavors. Yeah, I would say, ironically, the movie that has a bad heist. Mm -hmm. which is oh, i hate that movie uh because i love oceans 11 i love oceans 12 and i love ocean oceans 13 is like absolute favorite uh -huh. oceans 8 oh there's no conflict in oceans 8 mm -hmm. and it is a terrible movie because they're like okay we're gonna go steal stuff and we go and we steal it and nothing goes wrong and i was sure. like and the movie ends i was like <laughs> wow I guess I get to see what happens when there's no conflict in the movie, and it's terrible. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Someone is mentioning in the chat the Truman Show. The Truman Show. Here's the thing. So, yeah. like, the Truman Show is is a movie mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, Truman. Uh, like, once he realizes the truth, he's trying to escape. Uh, actually, he has a quite elaborate heist plan that yes. involves subterfuge, that involves, like, uh, tricking the people around yeah. him. He yeah. lays out a plan and heists his way out of the dome. So yes. and Not only that, but everything up to that point that he thinks of as being in, like, an organic life that he lives mm -hmm. is really a heist being perpetrated by literally everyone else who so, yeah, is we... tricking him and doing all of this setup. We can't count the Truman Show. What what's the other one I saw here that um There was a couple. Uh there, there's Deadpool one that I saw that I was like, ooh, maybe. Oh Evil boy, yeah, of course. Truman Show. The tree heists things in Evil Dead too. <laughs> well <laughs> not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. 
where, where it's like even mm -hmm. even something like um oh what was the tom hanks uh island movie oh um uh, castaway or castaway like you know any any movie in which there is a clear goal and then they kind of show a, a plan being formulated to achieve that goal that could be considered a heist correct what about march of the penguins <laughs> that's documentary. a documentary doesn't count yeah so. okay but you didn't say documentaries yes didn't we did count. yeah we did oh okay fair <laughs> enough yeah. we fair said nice. documentaries and biopics anything based on his nose or not heist because yeah. that's not what the point but anything so if, with with nonfiction, nonfiction, and so if there is, is if there is a, a an achievable goal and mm -hmm. a plan to, to get uh, that goal <laughs> to get that goal that is a heist and so what we need to do is look at movies in which uh the protagonist has no plan and fumbles their way through things <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, which I, uh, which is very, by the way, very understandable why you went with Big Lebowski, but it features several heists. Yeah, but mm -hmm. uh, but I've I've been saying this. Well, you you know where this came from? Hmm. This all came from. I don't know if you remember this, Mark, the D and D movie, because oh. Derek, who's one of our regular guests, asks, "Why is it always a heist? Why are there always thieves in D and D movies? Because we never we like no one talks about thieves, no one plays thieves, but thieves are always in movies, and that's where I came up with the concept that every movie is a heist, and then that's where it all came from. And because why was D and D a heist movie? And I said." And so now I've, I'm, I'm sticking to it. They're all heists. I, Everything's a heist. Everything. Everything's a heist. Everything. No, it's, <laughs> it's because a, a heist is, is um, <laughs> a heist is really easy to articulate. We need Correct. this thing. <laughs> Correct. And now we can watch people. And, and so it's like, you know, if it's like you said, if it's like a, a, a a love story right and it's like oh i'm trying to if it's a romantic comedy i'm trying to win the girl's heart oh that this is the thing i want this is how i go about doing it so that's all that's all heist's easy that's why yeah. it's a wonderful life. life is wonderful life a heist kind of not really maybe not maybe not i don't know it's more of like it's more similar to if you're talking those like shows like a grifter or a con where you're kind of tricking someone into doing the thing that you want by yeah. manipulating them mm -hmm. i guess then a heist yeah i don't know I, oh, okay. so I in a one in it's a wonderful life is there a uh a tangible goal that george bailey is trying to achieve i don't think there is well but the angel is trying to achieve something um trying to show him yeah but the angel does one thing yeah, that's true <laughs> maybe not maybe a wonderful life uh Ooh, let's go. see apollo 13 that's a heist movie they have tons of goals in that movie that's like how to get back from the moon get, i mean getting the astronauts back and planning, planning out how to yeah, get them back total heist is movie. the is the 90 percent <laughs> of that movie yeah and that's Hol that's a hundred percent a heist uh let's see fear and loathing in las vegas that <laughs> yeah that's a weird way see that one but i said that that movies that don't have consistent narrative structures sure. like uh like that or mm -hmm. uh what's the other one the um that catching fire uh the ah the crappy one i can't remember uh the uh something tales that one that one uh southland tales like those oh, yeah. movies don't they don't count because they're just like they're like stream of consciousness okay those are barely movies you know so you're just now saying that the things that you don't count aren't movies i'm trying to look up well no it's not that they're not based movies. on some of these criteria well that's like Here's saying one... is a poem a book they're both printed on paper but they're not the same thing okay movies are movies but there's different types and movies with no okay, is structure the movie big a, a heist the movie Ooh. big um is it a heist because all that happens is you know he makes his wish at the fortune telling machine and then he becomes an adult and he yeah makes well no there's a heist company way... and then he's not an adult like well, he doesn't wrong, heist anything. he has to figure out and plan how to become a kid again that is that really out. a heist though he just goes to another machine I was going to say, I don't know. I don't know if he does make that plan or if he just decides he wants to be a kid again. It's been a while. It's been a hot minute since I've seen Big. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. A long time. I was trying to look up movies that have mostly no conflict or like yeah. 
Yeah, Ooh, there's a, a little just bit kind of complicated. Of well, that's, but that's Googling pro- it. So, but that's really, to be honest, what I'm really saying is that, and this you learn in script writing 101, is you need to have conflict. Yes. Which brings us back to role playing, because like, <laughs> if you don't have conflict, you don't have a game, and you don't have mm-hmm. goals, and you don't have something to achieve. You know, so you need conflict, and you need a set of goals to get to. Sorry, a set of um, goal, uh, not goals, a set of obstacles to overachieve, overachieve to overcome to get <laughs> to your goal. You know what I'm saying? Well, so that's where and this, it comes, and that's like the the real thing. If we're going to bring this back to kind of like world building, yeah, role yeah. playing, uh, GMing, which is like, what's the one thing we keep talking about here? Tangible results, right? right. Whether that tangible result is you know to get the prom queen to go on a date with me or to defend my home from bandits or to uh you know get off of this island or to uh you know get the gem at the end of the thing like you need to set up a tangible goal and then Mm -hmm. you as the game master need to set up those roadblocks those barriers that will bring drama into it Mm -hmm. just like i think we can agree 99 0.5% of movies ever made. We're coming up with some really good examples, by the way, Mm -hmm. of of like conflict and drama without uh, without a tangible uh, goal. Mm -hmm. But steal from those movies. Like if if you love Home Alone, um, you know, have your characters trapped in a cabin that is about to be besieged by monsters and have them set up traps. Yeah, no, that's that's very good. That's yeah, very I've good seen idea. adventures where you set up the traps and let the waves of monsters walk into them, and that can be fun to be because yes. usually you're the one going into the traps. <laughs> right. I, I do want to point out that um, when when Jack says have a tangible goal, some people always think well more is better, but in this case, not necessarily. Right. Like if you have one of the goals Jack gave, that's going to probably be able to make a compelling campaign. But if your goal was all of them, because you're going to impress the prom queen by escaping from an island and getting a jewel from the <laughs> bandits that were attacking, <laughs> at, like it's just gets so muddled that <laughs> even though you're like, I'm doing four cool things that Jack Packard said, it's going to be the coolest. It's four times as cool. You actually have lost your kind of your killer app. You've lost like your yes. main thread. And now people are just going to be like, what's going on? <laughs> is he on skipping an island or getting a gem or impressing the prom queen or defeating the bandits like correct. what's important here focus so choose one one tangible goal at a time obviously you know there will be tiny little tangible goals along the way but one main tangible goal per arc yes <laughs> actually that is we're currently playing so i'm playing an adventure path with mm. my guys and uh and the adventure path is uh, Agents of Edgewatch, and they literally took nothing but heist and cop movies from the 70s and 80s mm-hmm. and turned it into an adventure. And you are, it is absolutely fantastic. There's like a taking a Pelham 1, 2, 3. There is a, um, oh, what is it? There's uh, There's Black Sunday. Where it's mm. like a suit, you know, bomb at the Super Bowl. There is, <laughs> uh, it, it's like every single. Oh, um, oh, what's the one? Oh, I forgot the name of the one where they're uh, district or, or not District Thirteen. Uh, oh, Assault on Precinct Thirteen. Yeah. Oh, there, yes. There's that one. So yeah, every yeah. they just took them all. They took them all, and I was like, oh my god, this is the greatest adventure I've ever done. And we <laughs> we all love it because to us, we're like, we are living these movies we're yes. literally leave, living these movies and now they had to break into a prison in another dimension and have to break out the president <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like it's escape yes. from new york this is fantastic i'm like these are this yes. is this is so much fun they they love it and it steal the, yeah, steal, steal from steal. all the things you love. Yeah, yeah, because that that's if you love it, your players probably will, and yeah. you know the beats. <laughs> yes, that's the best part. It's like, and it's just so much shorthand. Like they love it. We mm-hmm. all love this adventure because we know it's like, oh, so we have to break into a prison, find the president, break him out, and we're in another dimension, uh, and it's like impossible to get out of here. Uh, escape from New York. I'm like, yeah, pretty much. And they're like, this is great. 
I'm like, yeah. this is great. This is my favorite great. movie ever. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> how much fun? You know, and it's like, but it's in a fantasy setting. I'm like, yeah, but that's the best part. It's like they literally just stole, totally stole and just re- and reskinned it. I was like, this is great. How many, great. Do, how many do every adventure like this? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the fun of it is like the these things are tropes for a reason and they are they are uh oh, what do you call it uh archetypes they are tropes yes. and archetypes for a reason it's because we all know that language and in general uh we all enjoy it all right uh, i have to i do have to we, wrap up i shortly. know we have to go too but because uh yeah. this this has been an incredibly fun Hello. time hey what's that that's what's my that mimic. they're holding up steven that's my free mimic that if you guys pledge now you can um get this for free and then when i get them in i'll send some to jack because then he can use them as a prop if his... you pledge now we're at 49.995 so you will definitely push us over fifty thousand. Oh, which is like nice. the goal was 20 not 50 it's just a cool number so you can Absolutely. feel like you did that cool number yes and everyone watch adventure is nigh on That's second wind true. and you'll get to see all of your favorite characters like Queen Beyonce and little what's his name? I always forget his name. Uh, Toasty Cinnamon Buns. Toasty. The, Toasty. The important thing, the important thing is uh, this upcoming Saturday in what it's Wednesday. So what is that? Thursday, Friday in three days. Right. Uh, so, you know, we we all used to be over at The Escapist and because of some uh, shenanigans, something. Something. we'll call it. Yeah, something some, weird. Some shit, you know, some uh, fine. Um, uh, we've been uh, adventures now. I got taken down from the escapist, and we've been re releasing it on Second Wind. Uh, but the shenanigans happened right after episode eight. Oh. So this Saturday is the first new episode, never before seen episode of Adventures Now is this upcoming Ooh. Saturday. We have been putting in a ton of work behind the scenes, animating, editing, making sure that uh, our final three episodes, 9, 10, and 11, are uh, the spiciest of meatballs uh, oh for nice. everyone. And uh, so, uh, so we're I guess if you, have, <laughs> if you have Queen Beyonce, you could have a Professor Bill Nye. Um, and then I'm sure you could come up with something for Adventures Nye that would um, that would work together with that. Uh, I we've been spending a lot of time talking about heists, and tomorrow is the is quite literally Ooh. the heist to steal Queen Beyonce's necklace <gasps> uh, and the source of all of her magical power. How dare uh, they? Oh, How dare they? Yeah. That's and nice. uh, by the way, would you look at that mimic ne- dice box? It is so adorable. Everyone loves that. I know. Who wouldn't want this? <laughs> and you know what? Oh, you you get it, and and you get some phenomenal books with some phenomenal monsters in it. Uh, some some, some playable great stuff. monsters, playable monsters. But playable, yes, they could get that too. They could get it all. Just get it all. Just get the, the playable monsters and the the ancestries are the strange. <laughs> The stra- some of the strangest, most bizarre things you can ever play as. Uh, I love it. I think it's great. What did you think of the weapons? That was like the hardest. Intelligent one. weapons. So did you rules. see that one? Did you read that? One? I he did because he wrote. He did the ad and he yeah. talked no, about the right. weapons. No, right. He had to read it. Ooh, of, so course, of course, of yeah. course. No, I thought, like I said, for in, in my head, the way I would want to play it is, uh, and you know, this is what I wrote in the script is having like a, a friend swing me around. Obviously, uh, you know, you get your own avatar, so you can sw- you can swing yourself around, which start wrapping your head around that, but. <laughs> yeah, we have that section at the end for if you want to have your friends. Swing Mark you wanted to cut that from the be... script, by the way, and I said no. <laughs> no, I I said we might want to consider uh, he said, the, uh, whether or not it. we include that because of the cut fact it. that it's a section, it's a subsection at the end, That's but it's why, not absolutely. the main focus. He got and two. It, he the, got the ad might make it seem like the main focus two, if it's heavily emphasized. Two but into I the weeds. I said that one was fine either way. Weeds. I was just putting it as a maybe consider. Absolutely no. And, and to me, like, uh, like we spent a lot of time talking about is like, these are incredibly fun rules that really are launching pads for your bizarro ideas. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, check it out and uh, nice. check out uh, this Saturday, new episode of Adventures Nigh. Uh, so much fun uh, hanging out and chatting with you guys. Yes, yes. Uh... Talk about movies for the rest of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back next week and they'll still be on this same stream. Uh, and I'll could, be like, oh my gosh. 
Well, Mark is fantastic. I love Mark. I love Mark. I love movies. I was going to say movies, but it's, it turned into Mark somehow. Oh, well, oh. wow. Is that a Freudian slip, Stephen? Could be. Yes, it was. It was. It was a Freudian slip. <laughs> the nicest of the Freudian slips. Yeah, could have been. It could have been worse. Paul, well, I appreciate the appreciation. <laughs> yes. And uh, thanks, Jack. So much fun. Now, all I need to do is. I don't even know what. Like, problem with these life goals is like you start achieving them, and then you're like, now what do I do? You know, make make new life goals. I guess so. I guess I'm just that like, should be your next goal. My next goal is to make a new goal. Got it. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Jack, for sticking around for so long. And everyone, check out Second Wind and check out Adventures Nine and um, uh, Red Letter Media and anything All else. The and then see you. You perform live, is that yeah? True? If if you if anyone if you are ever in Milwaukee, just about every weekend, I am down at Comedy Sports uh, in Milwaukee performing live improv. Uh, not this weekend, uh, because we have to get ready to get Adventures Night out. But uh, most most weekends, that's where you can find me in person. Uh, but so these are the things: uh, watch Red Letter Media, watch all of our phenomenal uh, uh, videos over at Second Wind, uh, and go see live theater in your area because it's always a delight. There enjoy and, and watch movies. Enjoy art. Just go out there and enjoy art, y'all. There you go. <laughs> all right. Do you want to say the thing? All Mark? right. Well then, until next time, if you want to battle the zoo, you have to roll for combat.